I want to ask all of us to turn off our cell phones, put them on silent, please. You may notice board members accessing their laptops, phones, and other devices during the meeting. They are using their devices to access board meeting materials that are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California. As such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful of the need to conduct the board's business. Should anyone disrupt the meeting, I will ask that person to conduct him or herself in such a manner that permits the board to transact its business. The board welcomes public comments on items on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comments prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand or come forward and you'll be recognized. I would like to request all speakers to complete a presenter slip so that I can call you by name at the appropriate time and that the record of this meeting can be full and complete. However, this is voluntary. Please give the speaker slip to Ms. Cruz Jones. Thank you, Ms. Cruz Jones. I will do my best to call upon everyone who has supplied a slip for an agenda item and recognize those who wish to make any last minute comments. This meeting will be available via teleconference. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment during a public comment period, press star one and you will hear a tone indicating you are in queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not wish to make a comment, press star two. Assistance is available throughout the teleconferencing meeting. To request a specialist, press star one. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. However, that time frame may be subject to change depending upon the number of speakers on a topic. During agenda item 14, public comments on items not on the agenda, the board has limited the total comment period for individuals on the teleconference to 20 minutes. In addition, the total co public comment for individuals here at the meeting will be limited to 20 minutes. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During the public comment on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for total comment period from individuals on the teleconference and those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Each person is limited to three minutes per agenda item and business services staff will be assisting me with receiving the public comments via teleconference during this meeting. I wanna remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to three minutes or less. We plan to end today around 2 p.m. If you are a member of the media and require assistance or information, please see the board's public information manor, manager, Carlos Villatoro. Thank you. I would like to call the meeting to order and ask that Ms. Cruz Jones please call the roll. Dr. Casillas? Ms. Friedman? Here. Dr. Gonadev? Here. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Krause? Present. Ms. Lawson? Here. Ms. Lubiano? Dr. Lewis? Present. Dr. Mahmood? Here. Dr. Thorpe? Here. Mr. Warmoth? Here. Mr. Watkins? Present. Dr. Yip? Here. And Ms. Pines? Here. We have a quorum. I would like to remind the members again that we will be taking a roll call on all action items. So due to the length of the meeting that we had yesterday, we um, still had agenda item 10 and 11 and 12. Um, so we're going to do those agenda items first, and then we'll begin, start, we're going to do them after public comment. Um, so before we begin the public comments, um, we, we invite the speakers to come forward, but I would ask individuals making comments to not discuss pending complaints, pending, scene, pending licensing applications, or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. 
Such discussions are considered ex parte communications and they could provide information to members that is outside the record and in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. Therefore, such discussions could create a conflict and lead to board decisions being challenged in the Superior Court. The board can receive comments regarding the board's processes in general, but it cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where the decision is still pending. Board staff is available to speak with you about any pending matter. In addition, the board would like the public to address the board as a whole and not to individual members. Please be aware that the public comment during this agenda item should provide information to the board and is not a discussion between the board members and the public. The only action board members can take is to listen to comments and decide whether or not they want a future agenda item on the topic. No other action can be taken on the item at this meeting. Though this may seem at times like the board members are not being responsive, following these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising the speaker's goals or the board's missions. So we have uh, Eric Andrus. So some of you have heard the stories of victims that we've been bringing in before, but we have quite a few new members today, so I'm going to reiterate some of those today. At the last meeting, Ed Hollingsworth and I detailed my own story of being harmed twice by a surgeon and how this board closed my complaint, even though a second surgeon detailed in my medical records exactly what the first surgeon did wrong. As a recap, I was diagnosed with four hernias. The first surgeon did laparoscopic surgery twice on my hiatal hernia and both surgeries failed. When I went to a second surgeon to find out why, he fixed it and found that the first surgeon had instead of sewing my stomach to the esophagus in a procedure called a Neeson fund application, he had sewn it to the stomach itself, rendering the, pr the procedure useless twice. Every time I had to go in for more surgery due to the first doctor's incompetence, it put me in danger. They had to completely open me up the third time to remove all of the mesh that the first surgeon had put in, and I told her I didn't want, and correct the errors she made. I'm now requesting again that my complaint be reopened with the new evidence that I've now been diagnosed with gastroparesis due to these surgeries. Every time I eat now, I bloat to the point of being terribly uncomfortable, because my stomach won't empty properly for hours and hours. This very easily could lead to lots of other problems, including bowel strangulation, which my sister died of. I will likely have to be on an antibiotic for the rest of my life to force my stomach to attempt to function properly. My complaint detailed most of this, and the staff that you employ decided that none of this is outside of the standard of care. What I really think is that I'm being punished for coming to these meetings and holding you all accountable. Did any of you listen to our presentation at the last meeting and follow up with questions as to why my complaint was closed? Or did you just go home and forget about it? Out of sight, out of mind. It appears that none of you really ever take heed of the information the public brings to you as we almost never hear of any follow through. Also, as uh, we've often heard that as members of the public, we don't understand all the requirements this board has to deal with. And while that may be true, I've been trying to, for over two years now, understand only to be met often with belligerent block walls. Some of us understand a lot and are open-minded enough to see that change needs to be made so this board can do better. But what we're also seeing is this board sitting back and accepting the status quo instead of getting out there and getting the legislature to cha actively change the laws to protect consumers. 
I was recently threatened by a lawyer of a doctor for posting the public dismissal of his accusation on our website. I knew I was fully in my right to do so because this board keeps the document public indefinitely. I wrote to both Kim and Carrie to get information on this and neither of them responded to me. So when you sit up there hating that I come here all the time and hold you all accountable, instead of rolling your eyes like Dev often does and wanting to punish me, you should be blaming Kim and Carrie for their belligerence and unhelpfulness and for closing consumer complaints for people who were truly harmed by bad doctors. Please it's, conclude. Oh, God, three minutes is never enough. Um, I don't have contact information for any of the new members, so if any of you are truly interested in hearing about the ongoing evidence we keep finding, you know, please contact me. We're work, I, I did a lengthy interview yesterday with KSBY, which will be airing shortly, and we have ongoing interviews with uh, news, t uh, NBC News LA, 10 News in San Diego, as well as an upcoming story with the LA Times. Thanks. Thank you. Hannah Ree. Is it yeah. uh, good morning, medical board, staff, and audience members present. Please, please consider, consider allowing a BPM supporter to come and discuss our Underground Railroad and our network of safe houses and synagogues. It would undoubtedly save lives. With the non-diversified policing force targeting physicians who treat patients of color, we are the vital link into closing the healthcare disparity gap. The speaker would, of course, not be myself, but an HBCU CMA member physician working in California whose medical license is in good standing. And please consider adding the relevance of religion in patient health and physician burnout as an agenda item to not only improve the quality of life for our patients, but also to address physician burnout. Yes, we have meds, talk therapy, alcohol, toys to attempt to relieve burnout, but as we know, many of us turn to our religion for comfort, hope, and enlightenment. In my case, my Jesus saves my life. For all the healthcare providers out there experiencing burnout, I would say, if it ain't fun, then it ain't done. Life is too short, so find your purpose, keep your Bible close, and as we remember that, None of us are getting out of this alive, so best to love one another, help each other, and give the rest to God. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other people in the audience? Please come forward. Hi. Hi. My name is Virginia. Ten years ago, I thought my 40s would be the best years of my life. I just, I was practicing the 60 mile breast cancer walk and completed in October. The next month, I had a surgery. My life was never the same. It took over 180 medical visits in three years to fix the, the, the harm. I had 20 injections for pain, 50 pelvic exams by 20 doctors to figure out what was wrong. Before that error completed, I had another error that took an additional six years to heal from. <laughs> I didn't come to the medical board because my records are full of omissions, and when I tell a doctor about my trauma, the pen goes like this, and there's no documentation of what happened. So if you looked at my stack of medical records, you could not tell my medical history today, besides a small UCSF documentation up that's accurate. I have lost $700,000 and I'll never have a normal life. I'm turning 50 and I have nothing left. Not even nice clothes to pick out to wear today. And in this, I find that there's a huge crisis 
especially those with medical errors, this dissemination of medical information regarding female pain is outdated and 90% of the doctors did the same thing that was not helpful. 10% had a little piece of the puzzle. Nobody had a full puzzle. So it took, all, it took that many doctors to figure out the whole situation. When I had the other issue, again, dissemination information is outdated. I had to find, I had to research my thing, find a doctor who did it, explain the information, and that was a solution for part of it. And that's not acceptable for somebody with an associate's degree to direct a medical doctor on what to do. And many times I was right and they were wrong. Um, and also there's no trauma informed care in the medical system. Instead of understanding my communication is shaky and upset because I am traumatized. I am diagnosed with anxiety and depression and all this other stuff when it's severe trauma that has greatly affected my life. And you should know that if you know what I've been through. When I say I have trauma from a medical thing, again, pin drop. Nobody wants to document that I have trauma from medical errors. Nobody wants to address them. You cannot tell my medical records that I have trauma from medical errors. So um, I'm not sure even how to get help in California for trauma from medical error because you can't, based on my experience. And lastly, in my 12 seconds, the doctor's medical malpractice insurance company is worth $4.9 billion. They take away our rights to obtain legal help. Actually, I'm going upwards. So um, it's really frustrating that they're taking home millions of dollars and live in Diablo, and I could have been homeless if it wasn't for my mom. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for sharing your story. I know that was, was tough to do. And I appreciate if there was an up regarding dissemination of health information was talked about because there's an issue with that. Lying and omission of medical records and becoming trauma informed and compensating people who have been through things like I've been through. And thank you. Thank you. And that doesn't take away my $700,000. Are there any comments on the phone? Yes, there is. Our first one comes from Susan Lauren. Go ahead, ma'am. Your three minutes start. Hi, thank you. Um, USA Gymnastics protected Larry Nasser, who abused so many gymnasts and dancers. The Medical Board of California is in the parallel role, in my case, of surgical assault against Dr. Saul Berger. Your members know about this abuse and do nothing to stop Berger, who has gone on to hurt others. You enable abusers. Dr. Terry Dubrow, a plastic surgery reviewer for your board, was hired as the independent medical expert in my civil case against Berger. Dubrow perjured himself under sworn testimony in the depot and trial. I have the transcripts that show details of his false witness and unprofessional conduct, which is too long to go into detail here. Among other things, Dubrow said that Berger did not operate on my buttocks, but in fact, Dr. Berger made numerous lipo incisions on my gluteus and removed it for no reason. And also, he destroyed my legs, waist, breast, and more against need, consent, or rationale. Dubrow spun the mutilation Berger did as being due to skin laxity, a uh, slight contour irregularity due to age or weight change. He said there was no permanent damage or pain. In contrast, plastic surgeon Brian Blattner said the damage wasn't skin laxity or age. It was extremely poor technique and procedures that were unconsented, contraindicated, and caused permanent damage. Dubrow used his position as a reviewer with the Medical Board of California to unjustly sway my jury, and he uses it to get TV shows to gain public trust then he hires himself out as a very pricey independent medical examiner. By 2015, Dubrow had been hired by Tom McAndrews' law firm at least 10 to 15 times. McAndrews is the ringleader behind the perjury of Berger and Dubrow in my case. This team slandered me, caused me trauma, left me financially destitute, and sent me a bill for it. I hold your board responsible for me losing my case. You enable Terry Dubrow and let him testify in your name. Dubrow and McAndrews told my jury repeatedly that Dubrow was the standard for the Medical Board of California. 
with his perjury. In the exit poll, jurors said that they went with Dubrow because of his medical board of California position. So imagine how many medical board and civil cases have been dismissed unjustly because of these people and others like him, like the ones in the Hughes case as well. You cut out law enforcement in medical assault cases. The Medical Board of California Enforcement Officer, the last one, Christina Delp, told me to go to the police and the DA regarding the assault when she knew that medical malpractice is in the jurisdiction of the medical board. Lawyers told me that plastic surgeons are the lowest among the doctors. They harm people all the time and cover up for each other. That's not to say that some don't do good. A quick check of the... I'm finishing. A quick check of the Los Angeles Society of Plastic Surgeons. Um, okay, 49 of the 55 members of the L.A. Uh, Society of Plastic Surgeons, so um, desperate reviews, um, multiple reviews, easily searchable. These guys, police, plastic surgeons, can't police themselves. I want you to stop enabling abusers, change the LIPO code 1356.6, uh, enact a truth in advertising, and stop ban banning these um, ads, and have patients... Time is up. Our next question comes from Wendy Connor. Ma'am, your line is now open. Hi, thank you. Good morning, board members and chairperson. I'm here to discuss the complaint process and the inefficiency in record keeping. Um, the complaint people do not know where medical records are kept. There is no database. Uh, I had made a complaint against a doctor a year ago. Supposedly, they had requested the medical records in January. It was supposed to have gotten there within 30 days. Nothing was done. In, July, in June of this year, they requested them again. Again, no follow through. So I called through and I asked for a supervisor. And I was told there is no database of where medical records are kept. Your investigators are overworked and overwhelmed and undertrained, and they are just Googling the request, the Googling these records. The requests that were made were made to a facility that had nothing to do with the doctors. My point being, when a doctor fills out a form with his information, there should be lines on that form that say, where are your medical records kept? If they are kept in multiple locations from 2010 to 2015, they were kept in ABC. Uh, the location, the street address, the email address, the phone number. After talking with a supervisor in the complaint department, I called the doctor's office and within one minute, they were through US, the, the records I needed were through USC CAC. I was able to get the information I needed in less than a minute. Why is a database not being used? When I spoke with the supervisor, she said, wow, what a great idea. Yeah, it is a great idea. Think of the money and the efficiency and the time saved if you keep a database of where physicians keep their records. And even if they are affiliated with a hospital, it is the physician's ultimate responsibility to know where his records are kept. Um, I've heard arguments, well, it was the hospital. No. The physician needs to know at all times where his records are kept. And that is my issue today, is why is the board not putting that on the form? Why do physicians not have to? The, year, the, the time spent, you have a seven-year statute of limitations to examine a doctor. Now, I've, I've worked with the board before. During that seven years, okay, I was blinded by a doctor 20 years ago, and he was allowed to practice unhindered for an additional five years until he almost killed someone else. Then you just let him retire without any kind of disciplinary action. The point being, these records need to be these records need to be kept. You need to add that information to a doctor's profile so that you have a database which states, I am, you need a database which states where these doctor's records are kept. 
Thank you. It is inefficient Time and is ridiculous that the medical... Comment, if you're ready. Do we have any additional comments on the phone? Yes, we do have one more person who would like to make a comment, if you'd like. Okay. All right, Mr. Ken, Mr. Ken Wargill, your line is now. Hello, good morning. Um, um, I first want to concur with the previous uh, commentator. Um, um, essentially, what I wanted to re-emphasize is the board has taken a position. Physicians should take ownership and control of the records. And um, despite uh, um, this being a, a position of the board, it's not happening. And part of the problem is California Department of Public Health and the intermediate entities. The, <clears throat> the reason I'm calling is because there was a lot of talk about Cure's database yesterday and board's inability to be able to uh, look for the records of a, a Cure's query if done by a doctor or the delegate. But what I wanted to bring to the attention of the board <coughs> is something else. It is a situation where board's own experts have looked through the database, looked through the reports, and found a physician that is responsible for inappropriate prescribing. They go after the physician, and the case ends up in the Superior Court and then the Court of Appeal. And Court of Appeal takes a position that if the physician is not providing medical records, it is because the Medical Board of California has uh, has been unable to prove the probable cause for having such records. Now the question really boils down to is an addict is not going to tell that he's addicted. It's the board's responsibility to protect consumers. It's the board's responsibility to identify physicians and physician assistants who are prescribing inappropriately. And if board is lacking uh, an ability to do it because of some legal challenge, board should explore the alternative means. And these alternative means, you know, I've explored it myself, and one of the ways it can be captured, this kind of conduct can be, <coughs> or misconduct can be captured, is uh, by invoking what we call False Claims Act. And if a prescription, for example, an electronic prescription is sent to the pharmacy lacking an ICD code attached to it, because currently it is a requirement that an electronic prescription should have a supporting diagnosis, and a lot of time doctors don't get this and it over. And if an ICD-9 or currently ICD-10 is missing, that automatically can be uh, placed under a false claim investigation, and that's a good way to capture the misconduct. And in all those cases, physicians would not have an option but to turn over the medical records, which uh, medical board has not been able to successfully get from some of the pain doctors. I had a situation where my patient died, and, you know, me and the family, we were struggling what happened until we found out uh, the, from the toxicology and coroner's report what exactly happened. So instead of coming to the board, I went to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Sacramento Division, because I knew board would have been unable to get the justice to this family. So if a physician can do it, I'm, I'm sure board can reach out to the Department of Healthcare Services, Department of Managed Care, and all the entities, even Department of Insurance in some cases, to have those records as part of the payer provider arrangements, you know, uh, a payer can request the record. Now, what I'm trying to say is there is uh, other ways to get the medical records in a situation where a physician doesn't provide, and both should explore all those ways. Thank you. Thank you. So moving to the next agenda item, which is agenda item 10. We're going, sorry, I thought he said that was the last one. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I, um, I wanted to formally thank the board for addressing the issue of conflicts of interest and in adding the CMS open payments link prominently on the online license search. I think that's a very positive step in creating awareness of the information out there, important information that may cause conflicts of interest and affect a doctor's judgment when prescribing treatments and drugs. Um, as many of you are aware, and some might not be, um, I'm working with the Center for Public Interest Law uh, to sponsor a bill, and they are sponsoring the bill that would require disclosure by doctors of payments made to them by drug and device companies. This is not to discourage, oops, I just lost my, sorry. 
oh my gosh, I just lost my thing. But anyway, it's not, it's not to discourage research or discourage innovation. It's mainly just um, because patients have a right to know about anything that might um, affect their ability to have informed consent. So I just want to be, you to be aware that this is coming up. I don't know if everyone is aware of it. And um, I think it's Im very important to consider this, you know, as uh, many of us have been subject to causation from conflicts of interest that have been very negative. So I just want, I just wanted you to be aware of that. I totally lost my, <laughs> my little talk, but and that's, that's the gist of it. And I wanted to just make the create the awareness. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's move to agenda item 10, the executive management report. Ms. Kirschmeyer. Well, good morning, members. Um, please find the executive management reports under agenda item 10. Um, I would like to actually um, point out just a few items I really need to bring to your attention. Um, first, at the last meeting, a member had requested information regarding expert reviewer recruitment. Some information can actually be found in the enforcement program summary, but I also wanted to provide a bit more information. The board is looking to develop an ad that can be used on not only the board's social media, but provided to other organizations to use as well. It can also be sent to numerous publications for posting and providing information to their members. In addition, it was suggested that we send the ad once it is developed to those physician members who have stated they are willing to be part of the volunteer registry, which the board just released a few months ago. We are um, also sending information to medical schools and alumni departments. At the request of the Enforcement Committee Chair, Dr. Yip, I also sent a personal letter to the Dean and Executive Vice President of Medical Affairs at the, um, one of the medical schools who's allowing the medical board to use their auditorium for expert reviewer training session in 2020. We do have brochures printed that we hand out at events or presentations, and if any members would like to receive some of those brochures so they can actually hand them out, please let me know and I will get them to you. To you. Asking your peers is very helpful in our process to recruit expert reviewers. Board staff is beginning to have discussions with a few medical schools and postgraduate trainings to ask them to assist with the testing of the board's new web portal that will allow schools and programs to electronically submit information to the board. This portal will receive transcripts and forms from the schools and verification of postgraduate training from the training programs. Once the system is tested, it can be released to all schools and programs. We believe that this is going to significantly cut down on the time it takes to get documents and the time it takes to get individuals license and losing um, documentation in the mail. We're also in the process of establishing a lead medical advisor position in the board's enforcement section who will be able to review medical consultant and expert reviews to provide feedback to the physicians who review the board cases. This position would also assist in training and reviewing the sample report that is needed to be provided by physicians who take the board's expert reviewer training. This individual would also provide a post audit report of the quality of care cases closed in the central complaint unit. And that would also assist the board's complaint investigation office in interview questions and assist with the interview of physicians under investigation. And all these are ways that we're trying to improve that enforcement process and the reviewers that, that um, uh, uh, do consult consultations for the board. At the last meeting, Ms. Pines asked for an update on activities the board has done after the disciplinary demographic study. The first thing the board did after discussion with multiple parties on this issue, including talking to defense counsels, was to remove information from the, in, from the um, documents submitted to medical consultants and experts that could impose unconscious or implicit bias. This information included the medical school where the physician graduated, as well as any information regarding the postgraduate training programs that the physician completed. In addition to this information not being provided to the reviewers, the information is also no longer included in the stipulation memo submitted to the board members when they are reviewing a disciplinary case. The board also contracted with a vendor who provided in-person implicit bias training to board staff and members, health quality investigators, and deputies attorney general. Training was provided in both Northern and Southern California, and a total of 298 individuals took the in-person training. This vendor was also required to provide training via a webinar for those who couldn't attend, and that could be provided to board medical consultants and experts. 
Unfortunately, the original product received by the board was not acceptable, and it took about a year to going back and forth with that vendor to get a product that can now be provided to those who did not attend. The training needed to be more in interactive and provide testing for those who are taking the training. The board has finally received the final version and information systems branch has just um, provided this information to all of board staff who haven't taken it and we're also requiring other individuals um, to take it as well since it's been a while since the last training so everybody's going to be taking it over again. We'll also be sending this link to board members, um, health quality investigators and the AG's office so they can also take the webinar those that didn't attend. In addition to working on the webinar, over the last year we have also been working with the Department of Consumer Affairs to get a DCA statewide um, or boardwide training in implicit bias. Per the department, SOLID is working with the Division of Investigation and Peace Officer Standards and Training to finalize an implicit bias training to be presented in the fall. This will be an eight hour training session and the board will attend this training and see if it best meets the needs of the board. The board also through board members identified another presenter that has been recommended by one of the board members and the board is going to determine if necessary um, it may work on another um, contract to obtain this individual to provide that training to the board in this area in the future. But we're going to test that one with the department first, see how that is and then if necessary we'll get another contract. The last time I, I would like to talk about, and this is the most significant one, is actually the board's fund condition. At the last meeting in May, I reported that the board would be seeking a fee increase next year because the fund would go insolvent due to a structural imbalance, meaning we are expending more than we actually receive in revenue. As stated at that time, the board was expected to be at 1.1 months in reserve at the end of this fiscal year and would therefore be obtaining a vendor to perform a fee audit this year so we can look at an increase next year because the board um, would be insolvent in that following year, 2021. Since the last board meeting and even since the release of the report in your packet, several things have changed the board's projections. The first and most significant is outlined in my report on page 8. A 10A2, which is the increase in the hourly rate for the services provided by the Attorney General's office. This increase is expected to increase the board's expenses by 3.9 million in this fiscal year and 5.2 in the next fiscal year. In addition, the board was notified of changes in staff salaries due to bargaining unit discussions that will result in a 1.8 million dollar increase and a retirement of an uh, increase of 506 thousand dollars. There was also a BCP for DCA administration that increased the board's expenditures by 200,000, although this is actually a two year limited term increase. With all of these increases, this resulted in a 7.5 million increase in this year and a $6.2 million increase um, in, the following, in the following years. Uh, sorry, actually it's, it's 7.5 and then 6.2 this year. With statewide parada and all expenditures, the board's budget is now over $75 million this year and it will be almost $78 million next year. And that is without any additional staff um, being requested for our processes that we currently have. With this significant increase, the board's budget is expected to be at 0.6 at the end of this fiscal year and at a negative 2.4 next year. Obviously, all of these increases are outside of the board's control, but the board has to increase its revenue to stay solvent. The board is one of several boards actually within the Department of Consumer Affairs who are in need of a fee increase as soon as possible. We're currently working with the department to identify ways to mitigate the board's insolvency. Due to the lateness of this information, it is not something that the board can take action on today um, because we didn't agendize it as such, but depending upon the solutions identified, the board may need to have an interim teleconference to review the budget and to determine if a fee increase is needed this year. The board has not raised its fees since 2006 and therefore the increase due to these expenditures is going to be significant. This will be an overall fee increase impacting all license types and fees. So it's all of our research psychoanalysts, polysomnographic, training program, midwifery program, all of the programs that the board oversees. This will be an, um, it will, I'm sorry, I will keep the board apprised of the discussions with the department and the need for a meeting. We will work, be working on actual expenditures and ensuring our projections are as close to actual as possible. And that concludes my report. Are there any questions? Do we have any comments from the members? Dr. Lewis? Yeah, I'm just, my, my mouth is open when I read your, um, oh, sorry. 
turning this off. I'm just, my mouth is open when I read this budget increase from AGO office. And it seems like our, tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong, the need to increase our licensing fees is um, is really due to this kind of increase in our expenditures. Is that a big part of it? That's a that's a significant part of it, but it's kind of like the the perfect storm. In, in actuality, we have the almost $5 million in the following year um, with the AG, but we also have almost a $2 million increase in the um, the competence, the, the um, fee increase, not fee increase, the salary increase, sorry, salary increase oh. for individuals, um, compensation, uh, employee, and workman's compensation. So all of these working together, in addition to just, you know, we've been structurally imbalanced over the years. It's just kind of everything has hit now all at the same time. And so that's really the, the reason for this increase. So there, through bargaining unit, there were several um, entities who've had their salary increased. Through bargaining. And through bargaining, mm -hmm. as you know. And so that's what led to, you know, that 1.8. And then on top of that, you have then benefits that get increased as well when the salary increases. And then we have these other BCPs that are, you know, again, all outside of our control. Um, we have, over the last several years, we've also, um, usually we revert money in our fund. However, in the last several years, um, just due to spending and due to an, an increase in hours with the Attorney General's office, we've overspent in that line item as well as in the Office of Administrative Hearings. So just all of those now have compiled into where we are as of right now you know part of our problem too is that you know the law says that we have to be within this two to four month reserve and so it's something that you really can't even look at you know and move forward with any fee increase until you get to that two months because that's what the law requires you to be between so um, that's another issue that we kind of have to may have to look at in the future Dr. Gananadu <clears throat> yeah I came uh, following up on that I'm looking at AG's office, 30% increase in the attorney fee, and uh, the paralegal fee, 71% increase, 120 to 205, that's higher than a primary care doctor even gets paid in the doing moonlighting. So I am just puzzled here how, what are our options when they ask for such a high increase? So the, the AG's office, that we received a letter um, in early July that the fees were going to be effective July 1st, and then we received a subsequent letter um, that said that they actually wouldn't be um, effective until September 1st because they do have to go through a review process through the legislative um, committee, their budget committee. They have to send it through, but it's not going to change. But they haven't increased their fees for 10 years, and so... This is where we are today. We're a fee for service. You know, they charge us and, and the hourly rate, and we have to, to pay that for them. Yeah, but I, 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 I don't have a lot of problem with the attorney fee increase, but mm -hmm. the other two, the paralegal going to 205 and uh, the research analyst going to 195, which is 97% increase. Mm -hmm. Unheard of. So that's what my, my issue is, and we, it's the license fee which pays for these things. So I'm just, uh, just curious, what are our options uh, when, when uh, the agencies we contract with just send us a bill and say pay it? So we've, we've brought that up with the department, and really in, we don't have any control over the, the, the AG's budget or how much they charge. That's completely outside of any authority that we have. They do have to send it through the review process, but even with that is kind of like just a process that the legislature goes through to sign off on that. So they are outside of our control, Dr. Ganadev, and, and there's not much we can do about it, quite frankly. But is there a way that we can examine um, the, work, the work product? So what I mean by that is how they're communicating with us, um, are they, you know, like overcharging us? Are there things that are not, like are they sending a memo that is the same memo we sent to them, but they're regurgitating a memo back to us and maybe adding one line of some information? Is there, is there, is there a communication flow that's happening 
that's costing us that shouldn't cost us. And, and, and having said that, is there a way for us to do an audit on that process so that we can come back to the AG's office and say that we're finding over costs due to X, Y, Z, which shouldn't really be over costs. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So we can go through, we get um, monthly billings from the Attorney General's office that they send us. It's about, I would say probably like a 700 page report that we actually get. It's about this, if, if you printed it out, it's about this thick. Um, so it's a large document. So we can actually on our own go through that information. And it's something we've already talked about um, at our office is going through that and seeing if there's any places where we can cut down on the costs. And what are the memos costing us that we get from the attorney general? Um, are there any areas in there, like you said, with memos going back and forth, can we change that process? Do we also, you know, do we need documents to come in? Can it be a phone call that may be less time than putting a memo together? All of those different things we can and look at I, I can tell you because I've talked to Miss Castro before that you know she does also go through the billing and reviews it and looks at what the deputies are charging and that might be something that when, when we're discussing now a, a more thorough review of the spending and and be that being actually part of our discussion we have um, uh, calls every month that we do together and that might be another area where we can look at it and try to identify where there is spending that can be cut down with the the hours charged at the attorney general's office definitely i think that's okay. something we're going to need to look at dr yip and then mr watkins and then dr hawkins uh two come in one is that i think we kind of between what the AG thing is the best case so that they list it out and to us is what is the outcome. For example, some of the cases we read, they're listing every day how many drugs is uh, prescribed in every pharmacy. And to us, it's open prescribing. So prescribing doesn't matter if it's 10 days or 30 days. So a lot of those like typing, preparation, probably can be reduced if, if that can satisfy the legal criteria for those reports. Those a lot of go to legal, part of legal service. Uh, my, pick, my question actually relates to enforcement. Um, on page 10B2, the non-sworn investigator have a case load of 73 cases each. Would that be a too much, or what is the ideal case number? It seems quite a bit of cases to follow. And that going to question, uh, do we need more of those uh, non-sworn uh, investigators? Oh. So for these are our non-sworn individuals, um, Dr. Yip, that are upstairs. So what happened is um, we actually had a staff individual leave in our central complaint unit who does the malpractice settlement cases. So we wanted to keep those cases moving while that position was vacant. So we actually transferred those cases up to the complaint investigation office to handle that 73 number is not going to be an ongoing number for them. As soon as we fill that position, we're going to move those cases back to that individual. So that's that's just kind of a point in time right now that they have. But they it, it's not too big of an impact to them because they're still working their other cases that they have the criminal conviction cases, petitions for reinstatement, and the, um, they get the second level of review on those malpractice cases. So even though that looks like a high number, it's going to be for a short amount of time until we can get that other position um, filled. And we do have, um, with Susan Katie on board, she's kind of looking at this to make sure that they're moving forward. And, and they do case reviews. So I think we're okay on that one. Yeah. I know it looks high, but sure. it's okay. Also, but <clears throat> page 10B23, the every days to complete investigation, HQIU, another our outsource, I guess, the number of days... 2017, 18, 2018, 19 seems to be trending up. Uh, do we expect to see a decrease since they have been filling up the vacancy? So I don't want to steal the uh, Health Quality Investigations Office thunder, but they are working. You, you have a handout, actually. I think it's on the table talking about it. But they're going to be working on two things. They're um, filling their positions. First of all, I think they're down to nine positions that um, have not been filled, maybe 10. I might be wrong, uh, 10. And um, they're working on that. They have people in background for those. Um, but the other thing they're doing is they're going to be doing a task force to um, work on those pending cases that they have so the the goal is to bring that time frame down thanks Kim um, when was the last time this board did a fee increase so the last time we did a fee increase was in 2006 
Dr. Hawkins. Thank you. That was going to be my question and comments. I don't want to pay any more fees either, but uh, 13 years is a substantial period of time not to have any fee increases. Um, and my question is, after that comment, is there any other ways that the board can actually get revenue? Can bring in revenue other than that th those are you know because we are a specially funded agency that is the way we we bring in funding um the two ways the the one thing is you know way back um, when we went in 2006 we don't get criminal cost recovery or investigative cost recovery you know if an individual gets disciplined um they they don't have to pay for the cost of that investigation case, but we did increase fees to accommodate for that loss. That was a long time ago. That's something that could be looked at as, you know, obtaining investigative cost recovery fees. But really, it's our whole fund is built on application fees, renewal fees. That is our main revenue source. Doctor? How is uh, California board physicians fee compared to rest of the bigger boards in the country that is a great question I will have to look I will have to look into that and get back to you um, I do know amongst the Department of Consumer Affairs and it's been a while and I don't know if Patrick has this information but I knew know at one time we were one of the higher ones but podiatry even probably uh, well, I've, it's been a while since I've been over there, and that was probably about six years ago. At that time, they were $1,100, and our numbers are 783 So we're not, the physicians is not the highest within the Department of Consumer Affairs. And also compared to other states. Yeah, I'd have to look at other states and see. I like New York and, and yeah, Florida and Texas. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, Kim, I, I still have concerns, but... Uh, is uh, I'm sure it's going up for all the boards. I gather it is. Yeah. Can all the boards get together and uh, and uh, ask AG's office? Uh, hey, you can't just raise like that. I mean, if it is a private business, mm -hmm. let me put it this way, it will go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Ninety-seven percent increase, seventy percent was seventy-one percent increase. That's really scary. Even my high expensive attorneys don't charge for paralegal two hundred and five dollars. So this is what really bothers me. It's not about it hasn't gone up in a while. Yes, mm -hmm. it needs to go up. I understand that our license fee will go up because it has gone up. It hasn't gone up. And all the reserves we had are exhausted. I get that because state forced us to exhaust those revenue reserves mm -hmm. we had. But this type of increase from one one side to the other without any kind of negotiation makes no sense to me. I, I understand it's maybe the government works this way, but all the industry I know know where it works this way. Right. And I know you, probably, you know, what we would do if, so we charge other boards for services that we provide to them. And we also charge our probationers when we um, go through and every year we look at the costs. So, I, I don't, I cannot speak for the Attorney General's office, but because they are a fee for service, they, sh what we would have done is we would have gone back and looked at what did we spend over the last year and then identify how much that spending is and then what does that come out as an hourly rate for individuals. I know that's the way the Division of Investigation does um, and that's the way we do it. I, I don't know if that's the way the AG's office does it, but it's based on their actual spending and then how much should they be charging their clients. But as far as the department, I think that's why the department is getting together with us to see what all of us need to do to, to be able to be solvent and, and they are kind of looking at on a on a all group together, but as far as can they change that fee, um, I don't. I don't think Dr. Gonadev that is something that the department can do. Okay, Dr. Thorpe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I guess I, I, number one, I just want to um, second Dr. Gonadev's um, point. Um, I realize that you know um, private. Private sector and public sector compensation is significantly different. And to try and keep people in the public sector, it is important to be able to compensate them en enough so that they don't uh, leave their positions to go to, the to the go to the private sector. However, in this particular instance, 
it would be important, I mean, I, and I realize we're captive to this, which is kind of odd, but in, a, you know, in any other business, you would look for another vendor. You would find, mm -hmm. try to find another price that you could run your business with, mm -hmm. that you would try to, that you could w operate within your budget, or you would find other ways to balance the budget. We wouldn't just be kind of held captive and handcuffed in this situation. But it would be interesting to know what other paralegals and what other researchers are being paid so that th we could actually have an argument with the AGR. I mean, I, I mean, I realize that you can't have an argument with them. They, they basically dictate this. But it does seem that there ought to be some other recourse to this rather than to just be handcuffed and held captive to whatever. I mean, maybe, I mean, this is tongue in cheek, but maybe they should be, there should be a managed care sort of approach to this, like capitation, you know. Dr. Lewis? Um, I'm going to ask Kim, and maybe Gloria, when she comes up, can answer this. Are these um, employees um, in a bargaining unit? Yes. See, you know, those of you who have not been in a uh, public sector have to understand that, and maybe you do understand, so I'm not taking away from anybody, that there are bargaining unit issues. Your mic. Your mic. Oh, there are bargaining unit issues. There are benefits that go into it. Um, so those are things that are out of our control. They've already been bargained. So I'll, you know, I don't know if that's also a reason for the increase. We have no control over that. And, and I can't answer for paralegal, Dr. Thorpe, or the research analyst, but I can tell you for attorney fees, um, yeah, <laughs> ours, the AG, the 220 versus what I, I know some of our um, respondent physicians, it, but I can answer for the paralegal. I'm not sure how that weighs in, so I, that, I'd have to look that up. I, I agree. I have no problem with the attorney yeah. fees because I recognize that yeah. that is, but I also... Mm -hmm. Second, Dr. Ganadev's point mm -hmm. that at least in the attorney f that we use for our business, mm -hmm. which is quite m a lot more expensive for the attorney's fees, the paralegal fees are dramatically less expensive. Yeah, and that was the large increase for us. And we do use those research analysts a lot because they work on the statistics that, you know, is required for our board for the AG's office. So we, we can look into that. Ms. Lawson? Thanks, um, Denise. I I guess all I would say coming from the legal industry myself is I suspect if we do any kind of study about the attorney general's fees, including their paralegals, including any of their research assistants, that they are grossly underpaid um, by, by any comparison across government agencies uh, and also across the, the private sector. I suspect they're grossly undercharging us and that the system, this, this public budgeting system is not capturing their true cost. I think that the flaw is frankly in the way that this is designed and organized um, uh, from, a, from a government, you know, a payment system that we as government ag a government agency in the state of California are paying them this way. It's a, it's a flaw in our budgeting system um, that I don't know that we're going to be able to overhaul. Um, but we really should start having the conversation um, amongst DCA, amongst other boards that, that, that are charged in this way and have to pay in this way about how we're going to continue to fund uh, our own operations and, frankly, consumer protection, right, if we continue to have these ongoing conversation struggles. I mean, this conversation itself is taking away from, uh, you know, good conversations about public protection, consumer protection, as we try to figure out just how to, how to keep ourselves solvent. We shouldn't be having those conversations. Mm -hmm. Agreed. We, shouldn't, we shouldn't have to have those conversations, is what I meant to say, not that we shouldn't have them. We shouldn't have to have them. I, I think part of the issue in here, that is a great point, Ms. Lawson, because I think part of the issue here is that the Attorney General's office has not raised their fees for 10 years. We haven't raised ours for 13, so because of their huge jump, now it's going to impact us with a huge jump. So you kind of look at it, it's actually in, in, in it, it's a domino effect mm -hmm. is what's happening to some degree. And, and so I, I think that's kind of where we are because of that big span. Now it's going to be this huge increase, and now we're going to have to do this. It's kind of commensurate to each other. Kimla, so, on that point, can I ask a question? Just uh, why it, in the private sector, often fees are reviewed every year, right, right? annually, or annual budgeting is done. Is there a reason why? Where the, was there some sort of freeze on increases in fees um, across the state or... 
or it, is I don't it just know. not something that's We have done? not talked to the AG's office about that. We've been really talking to the department, but I think that's a great question that we need to ask because we do the same thing. We, when we charge our um, boards that, you know, get services from us, we review it every year and give them the change every year of to what that hourly rate would be. I think it takes, you know, probably a long time for the AG's office to look at it, but I think you know, that's something that needs to be discussed is this huge hit 10 years later is, is impactful. Um, the other thing to do is even with our probation monitors, we, for that, we look at that every year to let our probationers know how much they have to be charged. So that might be something, it, it'd be a big change, in, I think, like you said, you know, and how the state does things, but that might be something that needs to be looked at. Uh, so Kim, can you give us an example of what the fee increase is going to look like, just so that we have clarity? Yeah, I really hate so to do So where that. we are now, where the <laughs> fee I, is now, uh -huh. and given the current situation, not a probable, this is real. So given this current situation, what will the fee now potentially be? And I'm not going to hold you to that number, okay, but I want please, us to all have an understanding of what we're talking Please don't hold about. me to this number. Um, but it's going to be, de depending on what the actual figures are, that's part of the issue is we need to see actual figures. We need to know our actual fees that have been received for 17, 18, what our actual expenditures were, what our actual revenue was, 18, 19. Um, but if they are what we think they are right now, it would probably potentially be, and also our projections, making sure that we've projected the attorney general's number outright, making sure that we projected um, the employee compensation, that one's a given, that one's an easy projection, uh, but the AG's office, we're guessing kind of on how many hours we're gonna spend in those years. It, I would think that it's going to be anywhere between um, Right now, the fee is 783. We have a be able. We can go up to 790, but I would think that it will probably be somewhere between 1,050 to 1,150 um, per every two years. So that's like 525 dollars a year. Okay. Yes. So I would kind of a little bit disagree with Ms. Larson. This discussion is very relevant because whatever the cost is going up is ultimately going to affect the consumers one way or the other. And these costs, if somebody's not been increasing their uh, expenses for 10 years and all of a sudden it jumps on some people, it's going to affect people. So we should pass our concerns and uh, our uh, reservations to AG office or whoever is responsible that this should be a more relevant way and more timely manner so it doesn't affect board's work and affect anybody else too. Okay, if that's all the comments from the members. Um, Marianne Hollingsworth, Marianne's Hollywood, sorry. Good morning, my name is Marianne Hollingsworth and I'm a patient safety advocate. Um, in looking at this budget and the fact that the uh, board believes it will be insolvent by the end of the next fiscal year, there are, are two thoughts. Um, one is that considering how much money the public has had to pay for medical expenses, that going from 783, 790 to 1150 every two years is not really that much. And it, it makes you almost look like whiners to say, well, that's really unfair to doctors. You know, my husband's monthly cost for his cancer med started out at $2,600 a month and went to $3,300 per month, and that's a retired teacher. That's a huge chunk. So to have, you know, roughly $1,100 every two months, six fifty dollars a year, that's not that much. You probably spend more going out to eat every year than you do that. So I understand your reluctance to have an increase but when you look at the big picture and how people are testifying that they have had you know seven hundred thousand dollars in medical costs over the last few years it, it makes it makes you look bad and you want to you want to look like you're you know representing the safety of the patients which brings me to the second issue the main issue is uh, how will this insolvency affect investigations if we don't have money to run the board, how will that affect the, um, the budget for investigations, paying experts, paying investigators, and rooting out um, dangerous doctors? I didn't know if you were able to comment on that at this point. No. No? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. 
Ms. Ree? Yes, uh, thank you, Medical Board. So as, as you all know, I'm Dr. Ree. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Black Patients Matter. And um, look, uh, as, as I've been stating, there is a bias within the HQIU as evidenced by, by our uh, federal civil rights lawsuit, which is moving forward through the courts. And um, so let's, let's think of it this way. If I were not here talking to you about this, and let's say it's happening, okay, how would you know? How would you know that the HQIU was misusing, mis, um, misrepresenting themselves and choosing cases that were racially biased? How would you know? Here's an idea. You might have some um, evidence of this by the lawsuits that unfortunately some of you are facing from those who have, uh, have had actions placed against them. You might know by having someone such as myself on camera um, against the advice of all my attorneys to come here and speak out about it. Please, medical board, do not fund a policing and investigative unit that is not racially diversified. So along those lines, uh, we, uh, it was mentioned the implicit bias. Well, let's talk about explicit bias. Okay, so what is explicit bias? Look, we all work with um, physicians that with several backgrounds, private, hospital, uh, that sort of thing. But for whatever reasons, uh, some providers only treat certain patients. They only treat the elderly. They only treat the, um, you know different uh, patients. I would, I would uh, suggest to the medical board that we don't um, bias our um, experts by only choosing medical experts and consultants who have maintained a whites-only clinic, meaning for whatever reason, they've only seen white patients uh, for the last 30 years. And um, that would not necessarily um, you know, address explicit bias, but certainly um, amongst our psychiatrists. So in my case, um, the expert, the medical expert that the board sent me to was a psychiatrist. He had no, he was a cash only psychiatrist, never been contracted with Medicaid, never saw a Medicare patient, he was cash only. And on his eighth paid, page impressive resume, um, he state he had never been on a diversity panel, had never uh, been in an NMA meeting, none of that. And so um, again, medical board, I urge you please do not fund a um, all white medical uh, investigative force and non-racially diversified. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments in the audience? After hearing all your comments, I had things to say on that, but then I can't get what I have been prepared. Uh, the definition of per diem is from the uh, Department of Consumer Affairs Travel Guide. Per diem, meals, lodging, and all appropriate incidental expenses incurred that may be claimed while conducting business while on travel status. Can someone quickly verify, is that the same definition the, the medical board uses when they pay all of you per diem? Hopefully this will finally illustrate the kinds of problems I have with the board when I do a public record act request. On this topic, I have done two public record requests asking for the per diem documents that certain board members turned in when they would explain why they're claiming a certain amount of per diem. Both times I was sent documents that I did not ask for and that did not give me the information I was seeking. So this is the form that you guys fill out when you turn in your per diem uh, forms for what you do for each month. This is what I was sent instead. All it is is a listing of the days that you worked in the month. This does not explain what I asked for in my Public Records Act request, and this was sent to me twice instead. This is what I talk about when you guys aren't fulfilling your, your duties to provide P Public Record Act requests to me. You're breaking the Public Record Act law. 
So I'm asking again because this new information in Kim's report in 10A shows that the last year the total per diem paid for this board was nearly three times the amount that was budgeted. As an example, I don't understand how Randy Hawkins is consistently claiming these astronomical amounts for per diem every month. His total for the year came to $16,500, half the entire budgeted amount and more than any other board member, including the president. At $100 a day, that means he claimed to be working out of town 165 days last year on medical board issues away from his home and office. Remember, the DCA's own definition says it's meant for only while one is traveling. You can't be paid to do this job from your home port. Is Randy Hawkins really away from his home that many days working on board business? What is he doing that he can claim over twice what David Wormuth pays, claims or even Christina Lawson claims? I think an explanation is in order considering this major breach of the per diem budget and maybe the IRS needs to look into how per diem is being issued to this board. And Kerry told me after the last meeting that the breaking of the Public Record Act will never be put on the agenda because it's not in the board's purview to worry about it. I don't get that. This board should be concerned and responsible for everything about this board, especially when staff is breaking the law. You just took up the legal issue of a staff member sexually assaulting another employee and Kim and the staff allegedly didn't follow protocol to help her when she complained. But, but you, you aren't supposed to worry about whether you're breaking the Public Records Act law? Speaking of the lawsuit, if the board was given a copy of the lawsuit for the agenda item yesterday, a copy should have been available here to the public with the other materials and I didn't see it there. That's a violation of the Brown Act. I would also told that the no public comment was allowed before the lawsuit was discussed in closed session and that's a Please violation conclude. of the open meeting public commenting rules and could render any vote reached yesterday moot. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? You've already you, commented. No, you can't come back up. You've, you've done your three minutes inside this session. Are there any comments on the phone? There are two comments. All right, Mr. Ken Wargill, again, you are our open. Um, my name is Ken Wargill. I'm calling from Fresno, and I am uh, commenting on agenda item 10 I believe that's under discussion. Well, it was unclear from um, from this presentation of DCA, uh, other boards which also um, use the health quality enforcement uh, uh, attorneys and paralegals like Department of Public Health, Central Board, and probably other some of the other health-related board in field offices. Uh, if the cost is about the same, um, paying these attorneys and paralegal as the medical um, board is number two. Um, it was also unclear um, if a vertical enforcement model that was uh, sunsetted in December uh, uh, 2018 would have had any impact on the amount of the volume of bills that these attorneys and paralegals were getting and they probably are trying to make up for seeing the loss of business in coming years because the vertical enforcement is gone and uh, they may be under an impression to be able to fiscally solvent themselves they need to um, increase the cost to the projected cost. So that's an, another uh, interesting thing. But as a practicing physician, this almost looks like a, an extortion, an extortion by a proxy. It seems like the majority of doctors in the state would be paying to, um, to, to support the financial aspect of the investigation against their peers by um, uh, paying in terms of increased fees. I do understand that there, there, there is a need for increase in budget uh, for medical consultants and expert reviewers and to have adequate number of the non-sworn staff which may actually speed up the investigation. But it seems like, you know, paying exorbitant paralegal and analyst fees without having an ability how they are being used and writing a check and rerouting it to the HQE uh, and essentially the physicians funding all of this, it, it does not really... Um, sound right, especially because in a, in a situation where an acquisition is dropped or a physician prevails, he cannot even come back and sue the board for attorney fees. And those are the things that have to be taken into account because it almost seems like this is an extortion uh, by attorney general's office because uh, they know that all these costs would be eventually passed on to the licensee, either at the initial application or renewal and they're very confident they'll, they'll get paid. But I think this extortion must be stopped or at least be checked. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? 
Yes, there is. Dr. Khadija Lang, your line is now open there. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you all for the presentation. It was um, a bit complex for a telephone call. I apologize. That's my problem. But I'd like to comment on two things. Um, number one, I do have concerns about the amount of money because as president of Global State Medical Association, our members are, whenever they get involved with the medical board, 95% of the time they end up being unable to pay all of the fees that are brought upon them and this subsequently results in us losing positions to communities that are already heavily underserved. So when the fees are raised to get licensing done and it's passed on to people who have a much smaller profit margin because of the patients they choose to take care of that other people don't want to take care of, as many of our physicians do, it has a negative impact on the number of physicians available to serve this community. Um, additionally, on another topic, um, I'm wondering if we could get some information on feedback from members of the medical board that have done the bias training and whether or not any types of concerns, if there are any concerns addressed by people as to the adequacy of the bias training because it's great that the bias training has now been implemented and we appreciate the efforts to try to mitigate the changes that we did observe through your demographic study, which we're very appreciative of you doing, but we'd just like to make sure that the implementations that have now been done as a result of the adverse findings in that study are actually beneficial and that people are following up and making sure that they're working and that the people who are taking the training can see that it's making a difference. If there are any complaints about that, we'd like to know because we'd like to see how we might be able to help improve the bias training so that it can really be effective. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? There are no additional comments on the phone. Great. So let's move to our next agenda item, which is 15. We're going to skip back um, to today's agenda. An update from the Federation of State Medical Boards. Would Mr. Steingard and Mr. Chandri please come forward? Doctor, oh, doctor. Um, before they begin, I would like to introduce Dr. Steinberg and Dr. Chandri. Dr. Steingard is a board-certified family physician from Phoenix, Arizona. He served on the Arizona Board of Osteopathic Examiners and is currently the Federation of State Medical Boards President. Dr. Chandri is the President and CEO of the Federation. He is a Clinical Associate Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Texas Southern Western Medical School in Dallas, Texas, and is also the co-author of two books, Fundamentals of Clinical Medicine, 4th Edition, and the Medical Licensing and Discipline in America. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you very much, uh, President Pines, Vice President Dr. Lewis, and Director Kirkmeyer. Uh, thank you for your leadership and giving us this opportunity to speak. Um, and thank you to the board for all the work that you do on behalf of the citizens and residents of California. Uh, Dr. Steingarter here are sensitive to your time and appreciative, so we're going to try to go through these slides fairly quickly. But what we aim to do is to give you a snapshot of what is happening across the country at other state medical and osteopathic boards, uh, and also to give you some idea of some of the activities that the Federation of State Medical Boards are engaged in on behalf of state boards. Um, it was a fascinating discussion this morning to Dr. Mahmoud's point. Uh, we do, from time to time, look at um, licensing fees that are charged by the state board. So we'd be, I think this is timely to, certainly for this board, but it might be useful for other boards to do a survey of what's happening across the country. And that's part of our role to support you so that you can make informed uh, decisions or have informed discussions. So without further ado, let me uh, bring you greetings on behalf of our board of directors at the FSMB. Much like this board, there's actually 16 of us, so one more uh, than uh, this board, but uh, includes me as the ex officio. So 
essentially we have 15 people as well. And uh, we are physicians, public members, and other uh, professions are well represented. Um, I'm in the blue tie. Dr. Steingart is to my left in the red tie. To his left is our chair-elect for next year, Dr. Cheryl Walker-McGill uh, from North Carolina. And to my right is Dr. Pat King, uh, who is now our past chair from Vermont. Um, our vision and mission, uh, we were founded, as many of you may know, in 1912, is to help state boards, to support them, and to provide services so that you can do your work efficiently and well on behalf of your uh, residents in this uh, state. Quick organizational chart. Uh, again, may be familiar to many of you, but since there are new members on the board, um, each uh, we have 70 state medical and osteopathic boards in the 50 states and the territories. Um, each of them appoints a delegate who serves uh, on our House of Delegates, and our House of Delegates elects our Board of Directors. Fairly democratic process. We believe in transparency. Our meetings are open. Anyone can attend. Uh, they just have to register for it. And uh, our discussions are also open and transparent. We have reference committees, and decisions are made at the House of Delegates. We have no enforcement authority, however. We don't control the state boards. We were created by the state boards uh, almost a century ago, more than a century ago, to provide a space where you all can get together and share best practices practices and ideas so that uh, you all can work towards the common good. Uh, various committees report to each of those bodies. Certain committees report only to the board. Cer certain committees report directly to the House of Delegates. And again, those meetings are open and people are welcome to attend. Uh, this is our annual meeting. We do it once a year, 500 attendees from not only the nation's state medical and osteopathic boards, but also from around the country. This past April was in uh, Fort Worth. Uh, always nice to see representation from the state of California, either in person or by phone. Um, and we're grateful for those who have uh, attended our meetings in the past. Next year's meeting in April of 2020 happens to be in San Diego. Uh, we hope to see as many of you as possible. We think it's a wonderful opportunity not only to hear what other states are doing, but for you all to share good practices and best practices so that we can all work towards that common good that I spoke about. Um, this is our House of Delegates. Much Again, I wanted to, for those of you who haven't been, it's a very uh, democratic process. Uh, this year we decided to do reverse alphabetical order, so the people in the front uh, with the V's and the W's were quite pleased and smiling because they were in the front row rather than in the back. But it's, um, again, a very democratic process and discuss policies and recommendations, which, if adopted, are not required to be followed by state boards, but we are very thoughtful and careful in preparing them on behalf of state boards because they do sometimes become state law, sometimes verbatim, or not at all. It's entirely up to the state board or the territorial board. Um, some of the actions, just to give you a snapshot of some of the actions made by the nation's state medical boards through our House of Delegates, uh, one had to do with attempt rates on licensing examinations. Um, again, there's a question of whether uh, it's safe for the public uh, to allow multiple attempts to t pass a licensing exam. What, are the, what is the science? What is the evidence behind that? So we'll be studying that. Another is to look at emergency licensure following a national, natural disaster. Sadly, disasters occur everywhere uh, for one reason or another, and are the state boards set up to enable physicians who want to come and help to be able to be processed quickly is another resolution. These are resolutions promoted by various state boards to have us consider. These were adopted by our House of Delegates, so we will be studying these types of issues. Another was to update our, update our recommendations related to uh, long-acting and extended-release opioids. Uh, it still is a national uh, nationwide opioid epidemic, even though some progress seems to have been made in terms of stabilizing some of that, but it still is a national concern. Another area is physician impairment. Um, Dr. Steingart will speak in a moment about uh, how that particular res resolution is being addressed, but we were asked to come up with some updated recommendations related to uh, um, a problem that occurs from time to time, which is the impairment of licensed physicians or physician assistants. Uh, and then finally, uh, there was a board report to to the House of Delegates uh, from our Ethics and Professionalism Committee, which made some guidelines and recommendations for physicians who use social media or electronic communication in their personal and professional lives. What we've seen around the country is that um, uh, physicians um, are experimenting with social media, but don't always use it in the way that they should. And so, rec re 
reminding physicians and PAs about the appropriate use of social media we think is a worthy topic and our report uh, helped in that regard, we think. Let me turn it over to Dr. Steingart to share quickly some of the new initiatives that we're currently working on and look forward to your guidance and advice in the future about other areas we should be looking at. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is really a pleasure to be here. It was great talking to you all last night. Um, let me delve right into this. So. Um, our main thrust this year uh, will be in a couple of different areas. Um, as many of you know, uh, artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence has become uh, an issue that's, that's captured uh, the imagination of um, not just the medical community, but the public as well. Um, and it, it, you know, obviously we try and look at it from every angle, but from a doctor's point of view, from a regulatory point of view, uh, from a patient protection point of view, it opens up a number of uh, uh, potential problems, uh, and we wanted to try to get a handle on it. And uh, earlier in the year, um, in 2018, uh, the Federation convened a, a group of business leaders, regulatory, uh, med uh, regulatory uh, members um, in, in, together, um, and looked at, and we had lawmakers there as well, to look at what is AI going to look like. And when we finished it, we decided that it wasn't quite ready for a work group, for a formal paper, for recommendations, but it was most worthy of a task force. And that's what we've done. Uh, we've started a task force. We've had our first meeting. Um, and uh, we're going to start collecting data, not only nationally, but internationally. Are there boards around the world that have dealt with AI issues. Um, and that's gonna be coming up, uh, that will be kind of an ongoing, it will be more of a uh, report rather and probably just to the board, but we will definitely keep you informed. Um, our uh, Vice President of Legal Services, Eric Fish, uh, uh, is kind of head spearheading that along with our CIO, Mike Dugan, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Turkanda, Sarv Turkanda is uh, one of our board members, he's chairing that committee. Um, uh, move up to the uh, to the first one. Uh, as you know, we have a, a strategic plan uh, every five years, um, and uh, it just happens that it's falling in this year. However, we did something a little different this year, uh, and that is we moved it to a three-year plan. As, as I mentioned with AI, among other issues, um, things are happening fast, really fast. Um, and what we thought, what happened five years ago probably doesn't capture what's going to happen over the next three years. And so we decided uh, with Hank and Lisa Robin and our staff that we would move this up to a three-year strategic plan. Uh, we really felt like uh, it was necessary. And uh, Dr. Cheryl Walker-McGill, my chair-elect, uh, who's going to become next year, will be chairing that committee. Um, the the uh, other one I wanted to talk about was um, this, this was an ongoing issue. Um, uh, as many of you know, um, the career base of a doctor and their um, issues regarding competency is what we do as a board as they go through their career, continuing education, um, continuing development. Um, and it became obvious to us that we needed to keep looking at this on an ongoing basis. At the same time, um, we had asked, we had been asked to look at um, revise our guidelines for impairment. Uh, in talking to uh, our staff, we realized that those two actually can run uh, somewhat, not parallel, but, but unique lines that have a same umbrella, which is medical professionalism. And so we broke that, we started two work groups. One is on impairment and one is on medical professionalism. And that takes us through the entire continuum of a doctor's career. Um, and most specifically, the late career practitioner. Um, and how we can make sure that the assessment of that doctor is appropriate, it's fair, uh, it makes sure that um, we take into account many of these doctors are oftentimes uh, doctors in the community that have been mentors to many, uh, many of the physicians, and uh, we want to make sure we do this in the proper way to risk and to look for risk ways, look for risk factors and ways to support uh, uh, these uh, assessments. Um, on the impairment side, the impairment guidelines will be moving forward. Those are already in place, uh, but they do need to be updated. We'll be working with the uh, physician health plans around the country to make sure that we have a fair and uh, total view of all that. Um, 
a couple of other issues. Um, as, as many of you know, we've had a program um, on sexual boundary violations, um, which we are now calling physician sexual misconduct. Uh, this, is a, uh, this was a work group that was started by Dr. Pat King, um, our, chair, our immediate past chair. Some of you may know Pat. She's an internist from Vermont. Um, and what we thought was a one-year program really we were really opened, our eyes were really open to not just to the physician patient relationship, but physician to physician, physician to resident, physician to intern, physician to medical student. And um, we have had uh, in, uh, enormous testimony, uh, a tremendous amount of testimony, uh, including uh, patient victims uh, who have come forward and told us their story, a very powerful. Uh, very powerful testimony, and this at our meeting in Fort Worth, um, we talked about it more in a in a, another section, um, which was again really well done, um, and and I think it really gave medical boards cause for pause to look at how we look at this conduct. Um, we still we have two other uh, groups. Uh, our ongoing work group on um, board education service and training, again, board members trying to get them up to speed quickly uh, is very important. Um, board training, every state does board training the way every state does board training, um, every jurisdiction. Um, but we are trying to give you some guidelines to help you as you move forward. And the final one is, um, this is a new one, this is staff driven. Uh, board action content uh, evaluation or base. Uh, as you know, when you make a report, um, you use your language uh, for that report, which is unique to the California Medical Board. Um, when you send that to us in the form of an action report, uh, we compile that data and we put it away. But when we try to um, compare it to another state, if, if, other, if you wanted to know how do you compare to another state, what are, we doing, are you doing your best work, we have no way of doing that because language is so much different. So we've undertaken a, a project where we are trying to look at the language, make sure that the language makes sense, if possible, give you some potential um, structure to uh, possibly um, using commonality, if possible, for that, uh, without usurping your authority. So um, we're looking forward to that one's an ongoing process and I will just share with you that is a painstaking process. This is, this is one which uh, is really almost being done by hand because each board action uh, is a unique event. So I'll turn it back to Dr. Charlie. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Steingart. I'll just quickly add that um, as it relates to artificial intelligence, nobody's against technology, but I think the challenge is uh, how do you use it? I think uh, most uh, state boards would say that if it's used as an adjunct, that's okay. Um, but uh, to be used by itself, which AI could do, I think is where a lot of questions are being asked. Um, what happens when something goes wrong in that encounter? Where is the recourse? Where is the consumer protection? Where is the public protection are valid and good questions? And uh, so stay tuned. Uh, we look forward to presenting some recommendations in that regard. Um, quick review of some of our services that the Federation provides. Many of these services were created at the request of the state boards many years ago. The Federation Credentials Verification Service that this board uses was created by the state boards uh, through us back in 1996 when the states were struggling with a lot of for-profit entities that were claiming to do credentials and the state boards just did not know if they were doing their job or if the fees that they were charging were fair. So they asked the Federation to study it and one of the recommendations was maybe on behalf of the state boards the Federation could create such a service and now 20, uh, some odd, 20 plus odd years later, um, more than half of the nation's physicians, when they are licensed, get processed through the service, which is centralized. Uh, Kim plays an important role in an advisory group that uh, consists of other executive directors to make sure that this service continues to meet the needs of state boards and is efficient and fair and thoughtful. Um, and I think that's a, a good example of interactions between a state board and the FSMB. Many of you are familiar with the United States Medical Licensing Examination, which was founded in 1991. We also have the Specs Examination. I will remind you that this is within your toolbox. If you have a question about a physician's competence, regardless of specialty, this is a type of one-day uh, computer-based assessment that 
really we feel every physician should be able to pass. Uh, it is not uh, specialty specific. Not everyone passes, but if you have questions, many state boards use this tool, um, which is specifically geared towards practicing physicians as opposed to physicians who are fresh out of medical school. So just a friendly reminder that that is available to you. One of the big issues in USMLE lately you may have read about is score reporting. Uh, medical students are pushing to change the scoring from its three-digit score to a pass-fail to lower the stress levels. Uh, I think most state boards would be open to that. I think the challenge is that those scores are used to get into residency programs, not just for U.S. grads, but also international graduates. So we're aware of that and concerned about unintended consequences. So we're having thoughtful discussions about how to uh, sort of... Uh, you know, address that well and thoughtfully. So stay tuned, but that's one of the discussions we're having. Uh, you know, uniform application is, again, a simple means of streamlining the processes for physicians and for state boards. Um, all, all state boards ask similar types of questions for licensing, and so 27 state boards subscribe to the uniform um, application for physicians. There's also a new format for PAs as well. Um, every state has a core set of questions, and then there are state-specific addenda, which every state is entitled to ask. This has streamlined the work of physicians. We think it's reasonably priced. I think it's like $50, I think, is the fee to physicians, um, but it does make it easier, especially if you're applying to multiple licenses. Uh, but uh, this is, again, an example of trying to make the bureaucracy simpler and most more efficient than it has been. Um, we did a Harris poll um, not too long ago, and I don't think you will be shocked to learn that we found that the majority of Americans do not know what a state medical board does. Uh, I think um, sometimes the state medical boards make the news for the wrong reasons. Uh, all the good work that you do sometimes gets lost in the shuffle, um, and one of the things we're trying to do is educate uh, the public at large about what state medical boards do. The other alarming result of sorts was that uh, the majority of respondents did not know who to go to if there was a problem um, in their physician-patient interaction. Uh, they did not always think of the state medical board. They thought of various entities that have little or nothing to do with um, licensure or discipline. So I think there's an opportunity for all of us working together to educate the public at large about what you do, how you do it, and how the process works, and also for physicians. A lot of physicians don't always understand what the role of a state medical board is until they get a phone call from a state board, and then that's almost too late if you think about it. And so we're working with medical schools and residency programs as well. But one of the sites we have to be transparent with information, we, we believe very strongly, as do the state boards, that the public needs to have the information they should have to make informed decisions themselves, is a site called docinfo.org, where it's based on information provided by all of the licensing boards, but you can look up any physician who is licensed in the United States, find out where they went to medical school, where they are um, licensed, what is their specialty certification, whether through the American Board of Medical Specialties, or the American Osteopathic Association, and also, more importantly, if they've ever been disciplined. We've tweaked it a little bit to add a little bit more information about the type of disciplinary action, but if they want the details, we provide links to the state medical board. We also provide uh, information about how to file a complaint against a doctor, since that seems to be an area that the public doesn't always understand. So we're trying to do our part to educate the public, but uh, we think this is an important resource it's free of charge to the public. Obviously, we're not um, interested in, in, this is not a revenue source. This is uh, about sharing information that the public must have. Um, educational offerings, in addition to our annual meeting, we have board attorney workshops, and uh, uh, several of you, we know Ms. Webb and uh, Ms. Lawson and others have uh, attended our board attorney workshops in the past. Uh, it's an important opportunity for the attorneys across the country at all the state boards to get together and share common concerns. The meetings seem to be growing every year, more and more people. I don't know what that means, probably good, uh, but they're discussing approaches to discipline and to complaints. But we have other meetings, roundtable webinars, online. We know everybody can't always make it to meetings, so that's important as well. Uh, speaking of online programs, recognizing that physicians don't always know what state boards do and medical students don't know either, despite the efforts of some medical schools, we have created online modules free of charge to educate students and anyone else about what is the role of state medical boards, um, what is the medical disciplinary process, 
um, what do we mean by physician wellness when we talk about wellness, and for board members specifically, understanding medical regulation in the U.S., which might be a good online module for new board members to engage in. Now, here's the good news. We did not have to reinvent the wheel to create these modules. Turns out many state boards have these types of online modules, and so our job was to make sure that they were, we put in common elements so that nothing was specific to one jurisdiction, but no surprise, all the state boards have a lot of similar issues that they want to get across. So please avail yourself or, or maybe put it on your website somewhere so that physicians, students, and the public can be aware of these types of information. We have many means of communication. I'm sure as board members, if you haven't gotten them already, you will. Uh, our journal of medical regulation is sent out across the country. It's a peer-reviewed journal uh, published four times a year talking about the science of regulation. There are some data behind a lot of the actions that the state boards take. We have an annual report. We have an electronic newsletter twice a week. I could go on and on. We're also experimenting as, with social media. Um, I will say that this a board is really being quite progressive in using social media, not only in English, but also in Spanish. Some of the other state boards are watching and interested in, in sort of copying your example as well because they want to be able to use social media and some of the anxiety has been lessened by your use. Advocacy is important, knowing what's happening at the federal level, though we are focused on state-based regulation. Um, from time to time, there are federal bills um, uh, for instance, uh, some of you may have heard this past week, Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee um, uh, announced that she's proposing a federal bill related to telemedicine. That may impact all of the states. So though um, states, many states have rules and regulations related to telemedicine, and I'll be talking a little bit about telemedicine, time permitting, um, things happen at the federal level. And if we're not there, uh, funny things happen. So when you're out of sight, you're out of mind. So we've had a presence in the nation's capital on behalf of the state boards for the past 10 years and continue to be there to be your eyes and ears uh, on Capitol Hill as folks talk about sometimes even the value of medical regulation. Believe it or not, there are questions being asked about whether licensing is a public good or not and whether it gets in the way. And maybe we should just let leave it to the people to sort of decide and uh, figure out what they want to do, which um, I think would be a step backward, if I may humbly say. Um, speaking of efficiency and enabling uh, physicians to be able to move forward and get licensed to serve the public, especially as it relates to access to care, some of you are familiar with the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. It is not the FSMB's compact. This was created by the state boards themselves. We merely provided a, a, a stage and an auditorium for them to meet on various occasions and, and format. Uh, we, we did provide support to set up those meetings, but this was a compact wholly created by the state boards to enable uh, state-based regulation to be strengthened. And so uh, the states agreed to um, nine criteria that they all agreed that if a physician meets those nine criteria, it's kind of like an, a TSA pre-check or an easy pass that if you meet those nine criteria, these states feel comfortable in giving out licenses to practice medicine. And among those nine, nine criteria are never having had a problem with your uh, license in terms of a discipline or a complaint, and also uh, having a clean record essentially are two of the criteria, but also uh, others, basic common sense things. Um, I'm happy to report that over the last uh, um, three years, 2016 was really when it launched. Uh, there are now 29 states and two jurisdictions, the District of Columbia and Guam, that have, through their legislatures and their governors, have signed into law the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. Uh, those states in light blue are those that have introduced legislation and are having some healthy discussions about it. Um, some of you may be familiar that nurses have had a compact for many years. Each compact is different. Uh, the medical compact is specifically focused on state-based regulation, and many state medical associations have been quite supportive of it uh, because it enables physicians to be able to practice medicine while following state law in the jurisdiction where they're licensed. The FSMB doesn't issue the license. The Interstate Compact Commission does not issue the license. The state issues the license, and the state can take away the license as appropriate, but it is something that is gaining a lot of interest. Um, if there is interest in California, we'd be happy to uh, connect you with the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact Commission that runs it. The commission is made up of two delegates of each of those states that have adopted it into law. 
So some specifics, last slide on this subject, uh, the, the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact since as of June of 30th of this year has um, issued 6,200 medical licenses from the state boards to more than 4,000 physicians. Most physicians end up getting three or four licenses, but in theory, you could get 29 licenses if you wanted to. You still have to pay the fees because as we know, the fees enable the regulatory process to move forward. There was a federal grant that allows states who are thinking about joining the compact to set up the infrastructure to enable that to occur. The FSMB's foundation also provides money to support those needs. The commission, again, made up of state boards only, is hiring a customer service liaison manager because their volume is going up and there's also look, uh, a look at web page design and updating that again that is run entirely by the state boards um, this should this slide should come as no surprise uh, since California is such a large state with so many physicians physicians who are licensed in the state of California in red are also licensed in every single jurisdiction across the country now some of this may be because people have other homes it may also be because of telemedicine and that physicians wish to practice medicine across state lines for which you know you have to be licensed in the state where the patient is located but I thought this was an interesting slide uh, it's the type of slide that we can create based upon the data we have about the nation's licensed physicians and PAs. Um, spending a few moments on physician wellness, which, uh, to be honest, was an issue at first we hesitated to study because we thought, well, that's an issue maybe for the American Medical Association or the American Osteopathic Association. It's really not an issue for the state boards. But the more we thought about it, it became pretty obvious that physician health is actually a patient safety issue. And when physicians are not well, chances are their practice of medicine may not be the way it should be. So um, the Federation's House of Delegates embraced this issue and wanted to study it and the state boards put together a committee a work group um, but we emphasize shared accountability it's not the state board's role to fix this issue it's a multi-system issue so our recommendations uh, which ended up being the largest policy document we've ever issued has 35 recommendations the recommendations to medical schools to hospitals to residency programs to uh, EHR vendors um, as much as electronic health records are designed to be helpful sometimes they create stress um, and also to um, medical societies and others so we can all partner and work together to improve physician wellness and physician health. Uh, some general recommendations are encouraging physicians to seek help early. Um, in a recent study I saw most physicians have doctors of their own that they can identify. The problem is they don't always go to those doctors. Um, you know, you've heard the expression that doctors make the worst patients. It's actually not funny. Doctors should seek care for themselves and make sure that they're well, not just physically, but also for their behavioral health needs. Um, and so that should be part of the um, physician wellness concept. One of the things we found, and some of you are familiar with this, is that many of the state boards ask intrusive questions during licensing, which actually in some cases go against federal law, the um, ADA, the Americans for Disabilities Act. And so this was identified through evidence as an issue. Um, you can ask if they're currently impaired, uh, but the federal law prohibits questions about have you ever had an issue because they think that federally, at the federal level, that's uh, not considered appropriate. So as a result of that, uh, we made a recommendation in our work group, and when I say we, I mean the state boards in this work group, that uh, our recommendations are to evaluate whether it is necessary to include probing questions about a physician's mental health, addiction, or substance use. And if you decide to go ahead and use a question, our recommendation is to ask, are you currently suffering from any condition related to that? Um, many state boards across the country have studied this, including this board. So we appreciate the changes made in, in the Medical Board of California. At least 27 state boards have discussed this issue. Eight boards have discussed potential revisions. Uh, four are in the process of making changes. And at least eight boards have made changes to their applications, including this board. Um, again, this is not something we're going to fix alone, but it is a collaborative effort. These are some of the organizations we're working with, National Academy of Medicine, the AMA, um, the uh, Mayo Clinic, some of the bigger hospitals, AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, American Osteopathic Association, um, et cetera. So I'm going to stop there as far as my presentation about what the FSMB is doing. And if time permitting, if you would permit, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about telemedicine as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. Um, Dr. Gunanadev. Thank you, um, <coughs> Scott and uh, Hank. Thanks for coming.
It's always nice to come to California anyway, from Arizona and Texas. Uh, um, <laughs> USMLE pass-fail is a little concerning. Uh, that is one of the things residency programs use now because the first two years in most medical schools are pass-fail. So only grading system is in the last two years. Even that, students are pushing to make it pass-fail. So it will be so difficult for programs to rank people, uh, just like MCAT scores. If MCAT is pass-fail, the brand new medical school I was involved in creating had uh, 5,000 applications for 90 seats. So, I mean, they, it's just, it becomes so difficult. So, what are your thoughts on that one? So, thank you, Dave. That's a very important and relevant question for what we're talking about. The USMLE program, um, as you may know, is a joint project of the Federation of State Medical Boards and the National Board of Medical Examiners. Uh, we've always known that the licensing exam test is stressful. I mean, if you think about it, you might argue, well, it should be. It's not an easy test. It's not designed for everybody to pass. Uh, everybody can't be a physician, right? But what was surprised us was, uh, and we recently did a, a analysis, you're absolutely right. A lot of the medical schools, not all, but the majority of them, it turns out, both MD schools and DO schools, in their own schools have moved away from grades and are now pass-fail. That surprised us because now the importance of the USMLE is even greater than was ever intended. Um, and so residency programs, because they get thousands of applications, you're absolutely correct, uh, use that score for residency selection, for, which is not why the exam was created. The exam was created to give the state boards a comfort level for uh, the ability to practice uh, independently without supervision. So uh, we're happy to make a change, but we have to be sensitive to what this might do to the practice of medicine and the ability of uh, physicians to seek the specialties that they wish. So um, it's a problem, it's a concern, and we're, we've heard from residency program directors, we've heard from international medical graduates, we had a meeting um, uh, um, looking at this issue of score reporting. We, we asked for feedback, uh, Dr. Gananadev. We received 20,000 uh, comments from all sorts of stakeholders. So um, it won't be an easy decision, but we're going to be thoughtful and hopefully make the right decision. Uh, my fear is that any decision we make is not going to be embraced by everybody, but it's not a popularity contest. We want to do what's right, uh, but we want to also want to be sensitive to unintended consequences. And it, it should be noted, Dev, that um, there was no unanimity among the medical students that one way was better than another, mm. um, which we were kind of, in fact, uh, I went to uh, the uh, osteopathic meeting because the, the Comlux USA, which is the USMLE equivalent for DOs, um, they are following this extremely closely because they are obviously whatever they don't want to make the the playing field unfair for one side or the other, um, and uh, they uh, it was fifty fifty one forty nine for one survey and forty nine fifty one for the other survey. I, it's it's in, it's not a unanimous, and we have to do it one way. So, um, we, in fact, we were talking about it the other day, and and just trying to come up with some consensus is extraordinarily difficult. Um, no one has a, a, a correct answer. The question is trying to do the most good with the least amount of damage uh, is where we're, we're aiming. So I, it, it, it's really, it's very topical right now. Yeah, especially step one and step two. Step three is pass fail is fine. It's just to get the license. I think those two are the tough ones. Uh, the brand new school we had within Six months, students came running to the dean and wanted the grade, grading to be changed to pass-fail. Dean said no. They came running to me as the president. So we had no, no choice but to change it to pass-fail in the first two years. This is a brand new school in the six months we started. So students are very, they don't realize that when they go to residency program, these things are important. So, Dr. Krause? Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Um, I would suggest that you consider as you tussle over this pass-fail versus grade, that you consider a third option, which would be allow the examinee to choose which grading system he prefers before he sits for the test. 
So thank you, Dr. Krauss. Uh, this is going to sound glib, but it isn't. Um, I've studied this now because it's been talked about, and I get emails almost daily. Uh, that is uh, one of the ideas I've heard before. Uh, a challenge to that question might be that residency programs may pressure students to reveal their scores. Again, you can't control everything, but uh, it is among the um, options that are being talked about. Um, so it's not simply, is it pass, fail, or not? There may be some intermediate steps um, or a compromise that may be better. I don't know at this point, but uh, we're having discussions to try to make the right decision. Dr. Thorpe? Oh, this is, <clears throat> sorry, this is just very mundane, but um, you, there was a, um, an online presentation about for board members, for new board members, which I am, and I, it just doesn't clear to me how to access that. Um, so maybe offline you could give me that. Will do. It should be on the website, but I'll, I'll clarify that. Thank you. Oh, okay. Dr. So, so, so again, coming on the same point of the scores, uh, it is really a major issue for uh, international medical graduates like myself when you come over here, the major stress is to have a higher score to get into at least interview in a residency program. Would you consider some other having this test as a pass fail and having another criteria where at least international graduates can take some tests to prove the residency programs that they are well enough to be interviewed or get in a spot? So great point, Dr. Mahmoud. Um, a couple of the specialties, I can speak of emergency medicine I'm aware of, and I, I believe anesthesiology, Ha already have a sort of a residency selection tool that they've put together, but I'm afraid it's not across all the specialties. But you've identified part of our dilemma. Um, if we make it pass fail or something other than what it is now, we create a vacuum. Who fills that vacuum? What fills that vacuum? Would maybe a for-profit entity come in with a test of their own? Uh, and does that eliminate stress? It actually creates another stress or because you still have to take the USMLE and now you'd have to take another assessment. So uh, clearly the house of medicine has to be part of this conversation and it can't be USMLE alone. Uh, but part of the concern is we wish there was something for that vacuum before we create that vacuum. And yet there's also a sense of urgency about not taking 10 years to figure this out. So um, we're going to do our best. We're going to work with our colleagues in the House of Medicine to sort of figure this out, but um, if the USMLE isn't the ideal residency selection tool, maybe there should be one. How do you do that without creating more stress for international graduates or U.S. graduates? So uh, I could spend a whole day talking about this. It's a complicated <laughs> issue, but uh, offline I'd be ha happy to uh, get some ideas. If you have the answer, if the solution is right in front of you but we haven't thought of it, please reach out to me. Do we have any comments from the members? Uh, Dr. Yip? Thanks for the uh, um, information. I saw a slide that there are two public members on the bylaw committee. Uh, you're meeting like uh, from different cities and sites and all. How do you invite a public member? On the FSMB board or on various committees and work groups? Uh, I saw one of the slides, the bylaw committee, that you have two public members. Oh, yes, yeah. So I'll let that well, so this is um, the best and the worst part of my job. Um, every, every one of you here who is on the licensing board is a fellow of the Federation, whether you're a public member or you are a physician member. Um, our executive directors, we have actually three executive directors now on our board of directors. Um, and so uh, at the beginning of my, just prior to the beginning of my term, I get a book of people who um, would like to serve on the various committees. And uh, the book is about that thick. And their CVs and why they want to be, what committees they want to serve on. And I have, and there are guidelines among the, from, from our bylaws about who has to serve on what. And that we do have to have public representation as well as, phys as, well as board representation. The bylaws committee uh, does have, we can have subject matter experts, we can have uh, public members um, and physician members. So I pick out of that group, I have to pick the members of the bylaws committee. Which brings me to an excellent point, so thank you, Dr. Yip, which is, if any of you have an interest in serving on a committee, we would love to have you involved. Um, it is simply a matter of uh, either letting Dr. Chaudhry or myself know, 
um, and we will get your information over to our leadership staff. They will send you um, a comment, and actually, you'll, you'll, if you get your newsletter, you'll find that, that you can apply. I believe it starts in October, I believe, the first, uh, I think that comes out first. And then um, uh, if you send your information in, uh, it will not be my decision this year. It will be Dr. Cheryl Walker-McGills, who's the incoming chair, and she will give you uh, she will put your name in the queue. Not everybody gets on a committee, but uh, if, it's an, if there's an area of interest that one of you has, um, we certainly try to accommodate you. Um, some of the more interesting ones, ethics and professionalism has drawn a tremendous amount of interest. I had, for seven spots, I had 31 people interested. And um, in case you're wondering, um, we have some very impressive people uh, on these committees. Your CVs are amazing um, from around the country. So thank you for the question. I'll, I'll, I will also put in a plug. Um, we also are looking for state medical board representation on the USMLE test writing committees because the exam is not just knowledge and skills. It's also about professionalism, ethics, integrity, honesty, the, the things that are particularly important to state boards. If you're interested in learning that, there are workshops where we can teach you how to write questions for the licensing examination. It might be something that uh, is of interest to you. Again, if you're interested, just uh, reach out to one of us and we'd be happy to connect you to those folks. Dr. Gunanadev? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. So, uh, last question for me is uh, telemedicine. You mentioned somebody is putting a bill there. Is it going to make something about uh, change? What What's currently what, what the telemedicine doctors are supposed to have? That is, wherever there is a patient, they have to have a license in that state. So I'm not, so Dr. Gananadev, I mentioned that Dr., uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn, uh, Republican of Tennessee, this week announced that she is proposing a bill. So there's no language as of yet that's available, but we think that is to, this is to support uh, rural health in particular across the country. Well, we've not seen the details, but um, there, is some, there is going to be some reference, we're told, related to uh, reimbursement. There's going to be some mention of uh, licensing. So we're keenly watching to see what is put forward. But as you know, any bill requires both houses of Congress to support and approve and the president's signature. So um, from time to time, there are bills. doesn't mean that they all make it, but uh, part of our role on your behalf is to alert you to those types of legislation, to seek your input and guidance and maybe even testimony, if appropriate, uh, to make sure that the, the feds know about the role of the states. Ms. Stay Kirshner? tuned. Uh, just two things for the members Ab about the committee appointments. That's the email I always send out. Usually two of them come from the FSMB, and I send it out to you all. Um, just reminding you that if you do, when I send that out, it should be coming out soon, correct, Dr. Yes. Chowdhury? So when I send it out, we do have to have it on an agenda item for our October meeting. It goes through a process where the board recommends that individual for the committee. So if you do want to be on one of those committees, you do need to let me know so we can put that forward. And then on the federal legislation, just just if we find out, as you know, I'm with Samos, we've worked with the Federation before where we've brought federal bills here, taken a position so we can make um, a statement if we don't agree with that bill. So we'll, we'll watch these as well, and we usually um, rely on the Federation to kind of let us know where those bills are. Okay. Are there, Dr. Lewis, you have? Oh, Kim, would you um, again explain to the board members or um, about the attending of a, a committee or wanting to be put on a, a committee and the cost that we can get reimbursed because FSMB is now a corporation with CME in California. What was the issue with that? Uh, so the Federation actually is a CME provider, so the conflict of interest laws do not allow you to accept funding after a certain amount from the Federation of State Medical Boards. So it does cause a bit of a problem for us to be committee members on the, the Federation of State Medical Boards. So what happens is um, if you get on the board, um, you can... Uh, 
you may or may not be able to attend their meeting because we have to go through a process because most of their meetings are out of state and so to get the funding for that we have to put in a out of state request through the governor's office so that's the first step that we have to do to get it approved but then our board does have to pay for it after five hundred dollars carrie is that correct so you can receive up to five hundred dollars you will have to claim that on your form 700 that the federation has paid for that money up to the five hundred dollars and then um after that the board would have to pay so it does have to it it is not a it's not easy for us to be on the committees of the federation the state medical boards that's the issue right. okay. thank you and I'll mention that said, it's not that's an issue not unique to California. We became a CME provider at the request of the state boards. Uh, one of the uh, boards, Texas Medical Board, put forward a resolution calling on upon us to be a CME provider, and it was adopted by our House of Delegates. So we sought that. Uh, but uh, we are using technology uh, more and more, virtual technology. Uh, people can't always be physically where they need to be, but there are other means of remaining engaged. So I wouldn't say it's a requirement to physically be uh, available for a committee. It's always ideal because you get to work more cohesively together sometimes but we are using technology more and more yeah and thank you dr chadry because i am on the education committee and and i wasn't able to travel and it was very beneficial to have that availability to um, attend tel uh, teleconference wise so especially for a meeting that's going to be in california we, we appreciated your insight <laughs> are there any public comments in the audience oh there's still okay dr cross <laughs> I wanted to comment uh, in passing that uh, I have personally attended three annual FSMB meetings and served on a couple of committees and have found it extremely valuable, not just in participating through a teleconference, but participating in person and having the opportunity to speak to board members in, in, in many other states. I think it's a very valuable resource nationally and a very underutilized and valuable resource for California. And I have frequently spoken at our board meetings that in some respects uh, our state may be a bit short-sighted in inhibiting and setting up barriers for board members to participate at such national organizations. But uh, uh, thank you for, for being here. It uh, is incredibly helpful for all state boards to have the platform of the FSMB. Just quickly, because um, I know we want to get to Hank's talk. Uh, but. Um, uh, thank you for that comment. Um, we really do value the state medical board members. Um, to that end, our strategic planning committee, normally we bring outside sources in. Um, uh, this year it's all state medical board members for our strategic plans because we really wanted to hear from the state medical boards what's going on. Um, to one more point to the annual meeting. Um, and, uh, we didn't, just for time, we didn't do it, but I wanted uh, your president and I were talking last night about a program that you're doing for disaster um, licensing. Um, last year, well, for several years, we've had a poster session uh, for um, uh, for our meetings, where um, states will put up, state jurisdictions will put up a poster and um, talk about projects that they're doing. Um, uh, I really think that that's, uh, Kim, I think that's a worthwhile poster session for this year. Um, I know states are looking at that. And frankly, states are looking at California. Um, you are national leaders in so many different ways. Um, so something like that would be extremely helpful. And what we've done differently at our annual meeting uh, from previous ones is we actually dedicated time to people going to look at the poster session um, individually. Uh, and it was... Um, it was an incredible experience to watch all the people come to the posters and interact with other state medical board members and have those discussions. So thank you. Yeah, we, we are very excited, and we're, we're excited to be in San Diego. Thank you, Dr. Skyngard and Dr. Chandri. I'd like to have you just step aside. I'm going to have the public come up and make comments, if they have comments. Okay. I'm going to start with... Um, Mr. Andrus. I have to disagree with one of the points they made. Uh, this board isn't in the news for all the wrong reasons. They're in the news because they're not protecting us properly. Consumers need to understand that the good and the bad about medical boards, not just a sugar-coated version that comes solely out of this medical board. I wonder if the FSMB is also aware that this board has at least four doctors that are on the sex offender registry that are practicing medicine, 
and this board doesn't warn the public about it. We also have a board member who sat on a panel that reinstated the medical license of his friend and coworker who had sexually assaulted four patients, including a 15-year-old girl. I'm hot and cold with how I feel about the FSMB as a uh, patient safety advocate. On one hand, I'm glad they're there to help keep state medical boards above board and effective. However, considering how poorly all the boards are at actual discipline, it makes me wonder if they truly have any teeth in their mission. This board's 4% disciplinary rate is shameful and dangerous. The FSMB did come out with a report in June that they mentioned in the slide presentation with some good yet alarming points, and I wanted to just talk about some of those because they didn't really talk about it. Um, in their Harris poll. Nearly one in five Americans, 18%, have experienced an interaction with a physician who they believe was acting unethically, unprofessionally, or providing substandard care. Women are twice as likely as men to have experienced physician misconduct, 24% versus 12%. Among those who have experienced physician misconduct, only one-third, 33%, reported the interaction or filed a complaint against a physician. Among those who have experienced physician misconduct, a larger portion of men than women, 41% of men versus 30% of women reported the physician misconduct. Of those who did file a complaint or report the physician, only about one-third notified the state medical board, the entity responsible for licensing and disciplining. Less than three in 10 Americans say they know how to find if a physician has ever received a disciplinary action against their medical license. 51% of Americans do not know that state medical boards are responsible for the licensing and regulations of physicians in the United States. And as we talk to victims of bad doctors, we're finding this to be true. We're working with a victim right now who was egregiously harmed by a doctor that you recently dismissed an accusation on. They didn't have any idea that they could file a medical board complaint. They thought their only outlet was a lawsuit, and unfortunately the one-year statute of limitations had already passed for her because her mental and physical recovery after being harmed harmed by the doctor that your expert bungled the case on took much longer than that. I've asked her to file the medical board complaint, but I always have to warn consumers not to expect much since 96% of this board's complaints are closed without any form of discipline. So it appears that while you are often brag about your public outreach, it's clearly not working. Remember, too, that the FSMB is being mentioned in a plethora of lawsuits against Purdue Pharmaceuticals for their part in the opioid epidemic when they asked Purdue for $100,000 to pay Please for the conclude. printing and distribution of its opioid prescribing policy. There's a number of good articles on the subject online, including one in MedPage today. Thank you, uh, Medical Board. So um, I wanted to make a, a comment earlier. Um, the timing of saying it now may not be correct, but um, I understand we have rules of engagement um, um, with the speakers and the board, that sort of thing, and um, that we are really not supposed to be um, naming uh, comments toward um, one or two uh, so members of the board and so we at Black Patients Matter um, are very concerned about hate speech and uh, directing hate speech toward underrepresented uh, minority members of the medical board and that um, for those who engage in such hate speech we really um, look to the boards to remind us of the rules of engagement here and that um, certainly we, we want to voice our, our concerns, but uh, not um, call out uh, members of the medical board um, and deliver hate speech. So um, if, if that occurs, uh, board, please uh, remind us of the rules. And um, if, in fact, uh, there are speakers who engage in such hate speech, uh, please remove them. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? Please come forward. So through all of my experience with trauma, I can't well know what trauma was and healing it. I have over 300 hours in healing trauma. And I think it'd be very interesting to incorporate that into physician wellness and impairment because a lot of the underlying causes is traumatic stress from going through school, from residency, from healthcare violence, 
from seeing things that normal people don't see and losing people, not by error, but they lose people that they think they could save and that adds up and adds up and adds up and pretty soon they crash and burn. And that affects not only patient safety, but it affects their lives. And physician suicide is really high along with everything else. So incorporating trauma education in those board meetings and having trauma therapists that understand regulation of the nervous system, window of tolerance, how to actually heal it without all these big pharma interventions that can be helpful at times, but other times not. It'd be really beneficial. So I, and also one other thing with the new ACEs in trauma from care becoming very popular, it'd be very helpful to have doctors that really understand that. So I think it'd be a very good topic to discuss in this board and in the federation, federation about trauma informed care for yourself and for safety in patients. Thank you. Are there any additional comments in the audience? Are there any comments on the phone? There is one comment on the phone. Mr. Conwar Gill, your line is open. Well, my name is Conwar Gill. I'm calling from Fresno, California. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, um, the, the reason I'm calling is I was just listening to Dr. Chaudhry speaking on the first presentation, Agenda Item 15. And it's funny for me and probably interesting for you to see how uh, Federation of State Medicine Board claims itself to be a stage or a, um, a platform or a portal for boards to come together. But what one has to understand is this so-called non-profit organization. The moment it conceives a product or a line of service, the first thing it even um, it does is to file an application with the United States uh, Patent and Trademark Office. You know, their trademarks FCVS, BLS. You know, they sound like specs. Uh, USMLE. These are all trademarks, and you know, if these were not the trademarks, I would have uh, buy uh, bought the argument that it's just a stage for boards to get together. Well, we physicians, you know, have essentially, uh, we've shut our doors to entities like these that lure us to split our loyalty towards our patients. But Federation of State Medical Board continues to promote and market its monopoly on education, validation, certification, and now licensing, uh, robbing the state's the authority of licensing physicians according to the state's need. Interstate medical licenses compact is a product of FSMB. That FSMB, FSMB, of course, wants to introduce in California through the San Diego meeting now. Uh, this proposal would require California to compromise its 10th Amendment rights, specifically the rights that grants the state the power to regulate the practice of medicine and all activities that affect the health, safety, welfare of its citizens. By default, telehealth falls in this domain, and FSMB should try to stay away from it. Uh, While well, there is no evidence of enhanced protection to the public, uh, that these newly added revenue streams ensure, uh, will ensure any public protection, but they do ensure power to FSMB by means of mandatory utilization of federal credential verification service, physician information database services, FSMB indoor CME like specs, flat, uniform application. Um, the common sense and the public policy would call that uh, no official should solicit or accept anything of value that is of such a character as to manifest a substantial and improper influence upon an individual with respect to his and her duty, and medical board members should be aware of it. Historically, FSMB has lured medical board members and its staff attorneys by compensating in cash or kinds, and Ohio State Medical Board Ethics Investigation and Office of Indy. Uh, in my, uh, Inspector General investigation sheds the lights on this corrupt nexus that FSMB is trying to establish. Well, having said that, it's time for Medical Board of California to draft its own policy specifically to limit the interference of FSMB in the state legislative and regulatory affairs. Failure to do so would result irreparable, irreparable damage to public safety, public welfare, and public health. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? There are no additional comments on the phone at this time. Thanks. Let's move to our next agenda item, presentation on the use of telehealth, Dr. Chaudhry. Thank 
Thank you, President Pines. I'll be brief as best as I can. Um, you've asked me to give you a sense of what the states are doing as it relates to telemedicine and also to share with you um, the Federation's recommendations related to telemedicine, which again are not really the Federation. They're the state boards coming together, coming up with uh, sensible ideas, which were then endorsed by our House of Delegates and become FSMB policy, but they're voluntary. They're entirely up to the state board whether they wish to adopt or modify or use as they wish. Um, let's begin with the definition of telemedicine. Um, it's interesting when we put together our first policy uh, on behalf of the state boards, with the state boards some years ago in the 1990s, in the glossary we had to define what is the internet, um, what is the World Wide Web. Uh, we don't need to do that anymore. I think most people know what that is. But uh, we do define telemedicine as the practice of medicine using electronic communications, information technology, and other means between a licensee in one location and a patient in another location. Now, this is interesting because I was recently invited by the World Health Organization to speak in the People's Republic of China, and they're updating their federal laws for licensure of physicians, and they wondered, is using technology or a phone really the practice of medicine? And I was there with my colleagues from the United Kingdom, from uh, Australia, Japan, and Hong Kong, and we all agreed, yes, if you're using technology to deliver advice at the request of a patient, and that advice includes recommendations for diagnostics, for therapeutics, um, our senses, most state boards would argue that that is the practice of medicine. So it doesn't mean just because you're using technology and just because you're not in a doctor's office that that is not the practice of medicine. So that issue was settled by the state boards many years ago and is something to keep in mind. The other important point is that the practice is deemed to occur where the patient is located. I think one of you made that point in the conversations as well. This is a view that is not only endorsed by state medical and osteopathic boards, but also by the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy and the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, who feel that the practice of nursing and the practice of pharmacy is also where the patient is located. And if you know anything about state-based regulation, that's not unusual because should something go wrong in that interaction between the doctor and the patient, there has to be recourse. And so if someone is harmed in New York State as a patient, New York State would like to follow through and, and address that complaint, and they can't do that if the physician is not licensed in New York State. So people sometimes wonder why this is, but uh, this has been deemed by the nation's state licensing entities in healthcare to be sensible ways in which to look out for the public. Generally, telemedicine is not simply audio-only telephone conversation. Now, this does not include what physicians do all the time in follow-up care um, and in the you know people who work in hospitals who get calls in the middle of the night from a patient. That's different. We're talking about comprehensive care through the use of technology. When we talk about that, we're talking about uh, not simply telephone-only conversation or email communication or fax. We're talking about the application of secure video conferencing in many cases, store and forward technology to provide or support healthcare delivery by replicating the interaction of a traditional in-person encounter between a provider and a patient. And as the quality of technology improves uh, through high definition, um, you can do a lot more using technology. And I think the state boards have been thoughtful in their approach in this matter. So as I said, the FSMB on behalf of the state boards has long had um, guidance related to the use of technology, um, including some model language for the practice of medicine across state lines. This became a problem, frankly, in the 1990s with the internet as folks um, um, try to offer uh, prescription medications in response to fill out this questionnaire, give us your name, your email address, and your mailing address, and give us your diagnosis, and we will mail you a prescription. This was very alarming to the state medical boards and to the state pharmacy boards who worked with law enforcement to interdict. Um, so our earliest uh, guidance relates to the use of the internet for pharmacy, for our pharmaceutical prescribing. That has advanced as the internet has advanced. And so our, most, our latest guidance is from 2014, probably will be updated in a few years as technology continues to change. Uh, it's our model policy for the appropriate use of telemedicine technologies in the practice of medicine. 
Um, now, technology can also be used for uh, greater good and simplifying life for everybody. So there have been federal grants to support licensure portability. That is not specific to telemedicine. Ten states currently have telemedicine licensing laws where you can get a telemedicine license to practice telemedicine. But for whatever reason, the nation's state boards have not embraced those telemedicine licenses and feel more comfortable in having those physicians apply for a full license to practice medicine, which is one of the reasons why the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, in my view, has been successful because for those who want to practice, in med practice medicine in person or with technology, it enables you to be licensed in those jurisdictions, but you still have to follow state law. Um, and we point out that simply because through the compact you can now get a license in 29 states within days if you meet the nine criteria, you still have to follow state law. And if you break state law, that license will be taken away from you by the state uh, medical board. So I think that's an important uh, cautionary note that we provide as we talk about things like licensure portability. Benefits and challenges should be obvious, but uh, I think it's important to be reminded the benefits include increased access to care and not simply in rural areas. I was born, I was, I, I grew up in New York City, and in New York City, you might say, well, there are doctors on every corner, and there probably are. But, you know, if you think about the person who is not able to be mobile, who lives on a top floor of an apartment building, um, whose elevator doesn't always work, uh, there might be a real access to care issue for that individual to get specialized care, let's say, by an oncologist for their particular type of cancer. So access to care is not just rural areas. It may actually even be in a big city. So there may be some benefits to be able to use technology to monitor or to follow up care, uh, expanded utilization of specialty expertise. I was health commissioner on Long Island in New York from 2007 to 2009, and you might say, well, Long Island is a wealthy area where there must be all kinds of specialists, and there are, but they're not always easy. Uh, Suffolk County in New York has 900 square miles, and to get from one end to the other takes hours, especially if there's traffic. And so management of chronic disease, specialty expertise, all these can be helped using telemedicine and maybe even improved health outcomes and reduction of costs. Um, for those of you who are physicians, you know sometimes patients are what we call non-adherent. Sometimes they can't, they can't make follow-up visits. It's not because they don't want to follow up. It's because they can't. They have to take time off from work. There are other real challenges. So there are clearly benefits to telemedicine technology. I think the challenges are maintaining the same level of patient protection as in in-person care is a challenge. Uh, ensuring patient safety so that physicians don't cut corners. What we try to tell physicians who use technology is you still have to do a complete history. You still have to ask about family history, social history, allergies to medications. Uh, it can't simply be tell me what's wrong and I'll uh, email you a prescription. It has to be something more substantive than that. And of course, the physical exam becomes a challenge because um, part of what we do in medicine is palpation, inspection, auscultation, and you can't do that so readily with technology. Although, as one of you pointed out, um, technology is advancing so that your smartphone can do more and more. You may be able to put your smartphone phone on your, on your heart and have the doctor on the other end hear your heart. So technology is advancing, but there are still some challenges associated with making sure that the technology really does what it says it does. Privacy is also a concern. People are sharing a lot of information online as part of telemedicine. Is that line secure? Is there a third party that has access to that information? This raises federal privacy concerns, HIPAA compliance issues, and of course there are conflicting state regulatory statutes, reimbursements, which can trip up a patient or trip up a licensee who is trying to do the right thing but is not familiar with the different types of state laws that are out there. There is no uniform approach to telemedicine, so that can be a challenge. Um, broadband connectivity is, an, is a challenge. We are not yet at 5G everywhere across the country. I know that South Korea and China are competing to be the first countries on, on the planet to have 5G everywhere, um, but it is an area that obviously just because you provide it doesn't mean that people have uh, or can afford the connectivity to get access to that type of care. So that's a real challenge, and this is not a panacea. It doesn't solve all the problems, but maybe a help. 
Um, so one of the ways that we're helping address the challenges on behalf of the state boards is providing some policy harmonization, which is why we came up with this model legislation five years ago. Again, put together by the state boards themselves. The chair of that work group was uh, Dr. John Thomas, past chair of the Minnesota Board of Medicine. And uh, again, talk to industry, talk to attorneys, talk to privacy experts, talk to patients, and talk to state medical boards before we, that po policy was put together thoughtfully. Many states have adopted it, others haven't, that's fine, it's up to them, uh, but these are some model guidelines that may be uh, still of some use to you as you consider what to do in the state of California. Uh, we also had a work group on telemedicine consultations because what if you're not the primary physician using telemedicine but you're asked to provide consultation, what in real life we would call a hallway consultation. How does that work with technology? Um, how do you know it's a hallway, you know, for instance? So we made some recommendations related to telemedicine consultations, which again may be of interest to you. All of these policy statements, by the way, are on our website. If you look under legislation or advocacy, there's a listing of all of our policies um, and um, their adoption and their details. And then finally, licensure portability is another way of enabling telemedicine to occur while states still have the ability to control um, how that practice is delivered. Um, so some specifics, just for a few moments. So our model policy from 2014 is a guidance document. It doesn't tell you what to do. You do what you wish. Um, that is intended to lessen the regulatory barriers to expanding telemedicine while protecting public health and safety. Um, most state boards still feel very strongly that there has to be an inpatient encounter first before they would allow a subsequent telemedicine visit. But increasingly, I will share with you that state boards are open to allowing an initial visit through technology in certain unique circumstances and those circumstances are best defined by you all. Um, so I think that's an area that is still being talked about and studied. Um, educating licensees about whatever you decide is going to be important because, uh, let me tell you, there are a lot of physicians thinking of using technology and thinking, well, how complicated can it be if I use an app that my patient also uses? Sounds simple, sounds straightforward, yes, but there are challenges as it relates to the practice of medicine and regulation, especially when something goes wrong or if there's a miscommunication. Also, I think it's fair to say I'm an internist. Um, it's important for physicians who use this kind of technology to educate their patients. So at two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, if a patient has chest pain, that's probably not the right time to you know, charge up your laptop and try to reach your doctor, even though it's telemedicine. You wanna call 911 and, and have an ambulance bring you immediately to a hospital for intervention of some sort. So I think educating patients is also important. This is not, uh, though it seems easy, it's not a game. It's the practice of medicine. Um, and although written primarily for physicians, our policy was written broadly enough that it could apply also to uh, PAs and to other health professionals who may be regulated by a state medical board. Uh, I think this is one of the first policies where most of our policies are geared towards state boards to give them advice. This is probably one of the first ones where we also wrote the language in a way that it made sense for practicing physicians um, who were thinking of using telemedicine. We think it's important to educate them before they get in trouble, um, you know, and I think that's part of what this is all about. So basic guidelines, place the patient's welfare first. Sounds obvious, but it needs to be said somewhere in your document or your statutes as it relates to telemedicine. Maintaining acceptable standards of practice is important and complying with recognized professional codes of conduct. One of the things we've seen in social media use is too many physicians claiming a credential they don't have. Uh, just because you have a knack for dermatology does not mean you can advertise that you're a dermatologist. There's a definition of what is a dermatologist, and I think uh, the same applies for telemedicine. Some Sometimes what we've seen in telemedicine and social media is physicians making promises that they just can't keep. As physicians, I think this board knows and the physicians in this room know, you can't promise a cure. Um, you know, and, and so those kinds of deceptive practices are alarming and there has to be a means by which not only that the state board can monitor what goes on in telemedicine, but maybe also um, should something go wrong, that they have a means to get the documentation. I think that's the other big concern that the state boards have is in a traditional office practice, when something goes wrong, you request the medical records, you get probably boxes of files that you then have to go through. What about in telemedicine? Um, you know, do you get a disc? 
And then is it encrypted? How do you know the information wasn't changed or altered uh, at the last minute by the physician? So I think there, those are real uh, challenges for how the state board can do what it wishes to do in the setting of telemedicine. Um, we've been asked a lot about when is the physician-patient relationship established um, because there has some, as the attorneys know, there's legal implications for that. And so uh, the recommendation has been um, whether or not there has been an in-person encounter, the same standard of care applies. It's a patient seeking care and the physician agreeing to provide that care is probably the simplest and easiest definition of that physician-patient relationship, whether in person or using technology. I don't want to read every slide. You have this in your materials, uh, but we do stress in red that the practice of medicine as it occurs for nursing and pharmacy and other fields occurs where the patient is located so that the state board can provide the recourse should something go wrong. Uh, evaluation and treatment must collect relevant clinical history prior to treatment. It can't be an abbreviated form in the interest of simplicity. It still has to be as comprehensive as it can be, and the treatment has to be held to the same standards of appropriate practice as in traditional in-person settings. And also informed consent, making sure, again, technology is tempting because you can uh, do things faster, but faster doesn't mean cutting corners, and I think in the area of informed consent, that's going to be particularly important as well. Uh, prescribing, same level of professional accountability as prescriptions delivered during an in-person encounter, which means the sole use of an online questionnaire, state boards have said, is not acceptable as a judicious use of telemedicine. Um, continuity of care is important, too. I think uh, one of the things we've seen sometimes is if you use technology in certain circumstances, every time you use it, you get a different doctor or a different provider or a licensee who doesn't have access to your previous records. That is not a functioning system. There should be a continuity of care, um, and there also should be disclosures um, as it relates to fees, contact information, after-hour information, who runs this company, who runs this process, as well as uses and response times for messages and other communications should be reasonable. If, you, if someone sends you a message using technology, uh, waiting a day or two for the response uh, doesn't seem appropriate. And I think that's an area that uh, this board may wish to provide some guidance. Healthcare delivery is changing. Uh, there is growth of telemedicine and advancing technologies for the physicians in the room. Go to any medical meeting of any specialty. Technology takes up more and more space in the exhibit areas. And it looks really exciting, looks easy um, and expensive. So um, one of the questions is, does it really save dollars? That's a bigger question. Uh, technology can be expensive. Its use can be expensive. But it is happening everywhere. So it's coming to a smartphone near you, I suspect. Uh, consumer demand is going up. People like the novelty of using technology as opposed to you know, um, schlepping all the way over to your doctor's office, to use a term we use in Brooklyn. Um, demand for cost and quality efficiencies. People want to be able to see their doctor immediately. And the, the old time notion of, well, the doctor is available two weeks from now, is that going to work? May not be acceptable to the next generation of the public. Um, Integration of healthcare systems, more and more of the larger health systems, the Mayo Clinics, the Intermountain Healthcare, the Cleveland Clinics, are, the Kaisers are beginning to use telemedicine and integrate that into their healthcare delivery. So um, it may be time to look at your statutes and see if they're keeping up with what's happening around you. And uh, there are almost a million doctors. Our new census is coming out. I think the latest figures are actually closer to 985,000 licensed physicians in the US, MD and DO. The vast majority still have a single license, but we suspect as telemedicine advances, people will be seeking additional licenses to practice medicine and to practice telemedicine. Uh, our goal is to facilitate this practice without compromising patient safety or quality, and that's where we are helping state boards um, come up with sensible policies and sharing with you what other state boards do. I already showed you about the um, um, telemedicine compact, rather the interstate compact. Uh, it's not specifically geared towards telemedicine, but could be used for telemedicine since it is full practice rights. 
There is some federal telemedicine legislation I mentioned. Uh, there's continued interest in the current Congress. I just mentioned one bill by one senator, but a number of members of Congress are interested in supporting technology. Again, it sounds easy, sounds exciting, and it sounds like you're doing something substantive for your constituents, but uh, we want to make sure that they comply with state law, that they recognize this basic principle that the practice of medicine is where the patient is located. Uh, the FCC recently approved a $100 million telemedicine pilot program program aimed to increase access to telemedicine through increased broadband. I mean, a lot of money is being spent by private industry and by the federal government uh, and some state governments to enable telemedicine to occur. So uh, this is timely, um, certainly. In terms of state medicine legislation, this may or may not shock you. Uh, just this past year alone, and it's only August, there have been 250 bills across the country from state assemblymen, state senators, uh, related to the definition of telehealth, the establishment of standards, reimbursement and insurance parity, prescriptive authority. Um, I would love to be able to say that in all of these cases, the state boards were consulted beforehand, but I don't think it would shock you to learn that that was not always the case. In fact, the state board was sometimes the last to find out about a legislation that, would, that was either being proposed or in some cases adopted by executive order uh, without um, necessarily the same type of uh, transparency that one is accustomed to. Uh, states that in recent years have established or expanded standards for the practice of telemedicine include those that are listed, but uh, the, num the, the number of states are growing. Reimbursement is an issue. It's not an issue for the state boards. It's not an issue for the FSMB. That's a, a separate matter. We don't get involved in fee structures or uh, reimbursement, but it is an issue for providers and physicians and PAs. All states in the District of Columbia provides some reimbursement for some form of live video in Medicaid fee-for-service. That's relatively new. It wasn't like that 10, 20 years ago. So I think both at the state level and at the federal level, there is beginning to be more reimbursement, which means physicians and PAs are going to be using this even more, and patients are going to be asking for it as they hear about this availability. Uh, and also privately, 40 states govern private payer telehealth reimbursement policies, and there's a growing trend to expand that uh, for additional specialty types or policy types. Uh, 15 states in the D.C. specifically allow schools to be eligible for originating sites. You all remember when you went to school, there was a school nurse. Uh, many schools can't afford a full-time school nurse, so they like the ability to have not just a school nurse, but maybe a school physician who is available through technology. So we're seeing more and more, and many states are supporting that. 14 states allow the home to be an eligible originating site with certain conditions for those who can't make it to uh, an intermediate site. 39 states include some sort of informed consent requirements in their statutes, code, and or policies. And I mentioned as it relates to licensure, 10 states have telemedicine licenses. 29 states have adopted the interstate compact. So I'll stop there. That was a quick run through <laughs> of what's happening across the country in telemedicine. Um, and we look forward to your um, thoughts. I will say one other comment, if I may. Um, California is a big state. It's an important state, and this is a reflection of the leadership of both President Pines and Director uh, Kirkmeyer. When California talks, uh, the rest of the country does listen and does pay attention. So I encourage you to get engaged and involved. Several of you are, uh, but I think your voice is needed as we, at the federal, at the national level, with all the states combined, wonder about what to do and how to do it right. Thank you. Thank you. This is very important. I think that it's provided some clarity, and I'm glad, glad you're able to give sort of a, a world view on this, right, what's happening across the country and not just re, re, us getting a perspective of what's happening here in California. Um, so I know we have lots of people who want to make comments and speak, but I'm going to ask that you be real clear about your question because Dr. Chaudhary and Dr. Seinberg actually have flights at 115 is it 115 116 116 <laughs> so <laughs> we would like them there. to make it um so i'm going to start with dr kraus hank thanks again i practice telemedicine every day i have a uh, hipaa compliant uh, ehr system through which my patients are able to directly communicate with me they have access to their records i'm able to look at imaging studies lab results telemedicine is a very valuable tool as a member of this board and, and all of our board members, uh, we hold that a physician's duty must always be primarily to his or her patient, above all else, above his own personal financial interest, above the interest of those that may 
have contractual relationships with him or her. One of my concerns as I look at the growth of telemedicine is it's serving as a platform potentially for the corporate practice of medicine. Uh, there are many for-profit corporations that set up a telemedicine platform and recruit doctors uh, whom become contracted with these corporations. In the process, what do you suggest in terms of creating safeguards so that those physicians who contract with those corporations truly maintain a primary responsibility to the patients? I think that's an excellent point, Dr. Krauss. Uh, it's one of the reasons our telemedicine policy early on in our discussions identified the need to educate doctors uh, because uh, we suspect there are doctors with go good intentions um, as well as those with bad intentions, but the ones with good intentions may not fully understand what they're getting into. It just seems so easy. And if you go to the exhibitors, they make it sound easy. Uh, and there are lots of companies offering lucrative contracts for physicians and PAs to get involved and say, hey, everyone's doing it, come on board. But um, I think the challenge there is educating as best and raising awareness. Um, as I've said this many times in my 10 years as CEO of the FSMB, the state boards only know what they know. Um, it is a complaint-based system. We, they do not have the resources. You all don't have the resources to be overseeing every physician-patient encounter. And so you rely on hearing from those who feel something is amiss. And, uh, but before that happens, is there something you can do to prevent that from happening in the first place is the challenge. And I think having clear-cut policies and, edge, and sharing those broadly, as broadly as you can, leveraging some of the companies themselves to get those policies across, I think would be one step in the right direction. Anyone else? Oh, I saw it. Ms. Freeman. Very quickly, thank you very, very much in respect of your plain time. Um, mental health is really the civil rights issue of our time and one of the most obvious uses of telemedicine is mental health. Have you seen a movement in that direction so that mental health will probably become all telemedicine? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Ms. Friedman. Um, at the national level, there is great interest in providing telemedicine and facilitating telemedicine, which is why there's, I, I, in part, uh, emerging federal legislation and not just state legislation, looking at mental health of veterans, looking at um, care of post-traumatic stress disorders, um, and for others, uh, because mental health and addiction and substance abuse disorders are a continuing problem in our nation, and there just are not enough providers, or the access to those providers is not readily available. So I would say definitely uh, mental health services is a key part uh, by which telemedicine may be able to help. Um, I served in the U.S. Air Force for eight years as a flight surgeon, and I have lots of colleagues who've gone through uh, trauma, both literal trauma and just by being witness to what they saw in combat. And so I, 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 it, it's an issue that resonates with me very much so, but it is an issue, area that is of focus. But it should be an issue also of reducing the cost. Hopefully, uh, yeah, and if you think about it, 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 the notion that you hear is if you don't have to drive halfway across town to see somebody um, uh, and you don't have to take time off from work, maybe that's a savings. True, but depends on the type of technology, and there are some for-profit entities that are in this space, um, and so uh, you wonder, because I think the definitive studies haven't been done as to whether it really does save money because the technology itself seems to be quite expensive. So that is a balance that is not my area of expertise um, and is an area that I, I know is being looked at. You're welcome. Yeah. My, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. As uh, telemedicine increases, it's like a huge market expansion and a technological explosion. Now, we know when any new technology is introduced, the growth is exponential once it gains traction, right? So for me, is then you cannot apply the same standard of care. You may have to, uh, as a, this is a thinking point, you may, not, you may have to increase that standard of care because the, sa the standard of care right now is rendering this outcome, say in medical errors, for example. And 
if you do not address the standard of care that is aligning with the technology, then that error rate or the medical errors will also exponentially grow in that same way, keeping all things equal. So that was just a thought. I think it's an excellent point, which is one of the reasons, and I think we knew this even in 2014 when we issued our policy guidance, that though it seemed very comprehensive and very current, uh, we wondered about the future and when are we going to look at it? Literally, someone at the meeting said, when are we going to update this policy? And we said, we just updated it now. And they said, yeah, but things change. And I think there will be some good questions about if there is access everywhere, does that change in any way expectations of care, expectations of standards? Um, and I think that's a reasonable and appropriate question to ask. And so if you do come up with some statutes, I would urge you to uh, revisit them uh, as often as you deem necessary. Dr. Mahmood. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. So as we all know, telemedicine is growing. And not only just like in the state of California, somebody practicing in the state of California and doing telemedicine rest of the United States, number one. And with present situation, there is a lot of uh, restriction on travel and telemedicine is growing internationally. What California can do, California is a very important and top destination for people from all over the world to come and seek medical help. But at the same time, there are predatory people who are using some premium addresses like Cedar Sinai around or Beverly Hills or Palo Alto and giving advice to people in different corners of the world like Philippines or China or whatever destination is. And those people are paying them. Is the medical board should they look into the thing that people who are doing telemedicine, they should be registered with the medical board and they should tell the medical board where are they giving advices and what kind of reimbursement they're taking and which state other than California they are doing telemedicine because they, if they are not licensed and state doesn't know, that would be a big problem later on. So uh, these, these are the emerging issues and I'm pretty sure you have looked at that or have you looked into that? So thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. It's, it's an even bigger issue. I didn't intentionally mention it because it's still an area being looked at. Um, uh, Ms. Kirkmeyer knows that there's an international association of medical regulators, and they don't know how to address that because now we're talking about not just going across state lines. We're talking about going across national borders, and it is happening. Um, I'm aware of a number of entities that uh, practice medicine, for example, in the state of Texas and other states where they're physically, the, the pr providers are located in another country. Now, they're smart because they've maintained their licensure, they're board certified, whether they're doing radiology or some other service, uh, but how do you know, how does the patient know that that actually is who it, they claim to be and whether they are truly in the country in which they state? So I think those are areas that uh, definitely are emerging. It's a challenge because, you know, uh, it's, like, it's like my son when he was playing video games online when he was 10 years old at home, and I said, are you playing by yourself? He said, no, I'm playing with a friend. And I said, um, which friend? He's like, some person I met in South Africa. I'm like, but you've never been to South Africa. And he said, no, no, he's from South Africa, and I just found him and we're playing. I'm like, how do you know? He's, first of all, how do you know he's another boy uh, from South Africa? He could be someone completely different. So um, I think that's a concern. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any, Dr. Thor? Um, thank, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, for that presentation. I think it just raises the awareness of us as a, as a board to, the, to be aware of this. Um, and I, I think for it in my own personal uh, experience, after my community was destroyed by the campfire on November 8, 2020, 18, um, my medical group in, uh, in uh, well, with, with Blue Shield of California and Teladoc put together a uh, platform for reaching out to our patients who had been scattered around the country, not around the country, but in California. Um, it, it is a growing thing, and it, and, and it allows, I think, an expansion of the ability for a physician and a patient in chronic care management, in particular for primary care, um, we do not use this without seeing somebody in person, initially at least, so we can get the ability to examine them. But there are extensions that are now 
uh, increasingly available, as I was mentioning last night, um, extensions on your cell phone that allow you to look in the ear, allow you to look in the throat, allow you to auscultate the heart and lungs. We are testing those to see whether they actually are legitimate. But along with remote patient monitoring devices, like blood pressure cuffs that automatically send information, it provides the opportunity to extend the office and the team into the community in a way that we've never been able to do that before. And it allows people to get a touch from their clinician much more commonly and much more effectively, maybe intervening sooner and hopefully decreasing emergency room visits. That's a comment, not so much as a question. But I guess the question is, I think there's going to be tiers of how telemedicine is used. There is a tier where I can see it being used for primary care, a tier for specialty evaluation, and then this tier for maybe subspecialty, really specialty evaluation that you can't get maybe in the United States even, maybe not, maybe in France or Russia or someplace else where that is a very much more difficult um, problem. But I would, anyway, I think this board needs to look at those kind of issues, how we're going, we going to regulate that here in California, but also um, the issue of how do we manage it in this more um, international thing too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. Excellent comments, all of them, uh, especially given what happened, the tragic situation in Paradise, uh, California. I think, um, I think also there's a role for the FDA. We're talking about medical devices in many cases. This is not something for the state boards, thankfully, to figure out by themselves. Uh, there are some federal entities that have jurisdiction over what is claimed. And uh, I think they're looking at or trying to tighten up their processes and do the right thing while also being nimble and flexible so as not to create too many restrictions either. So I think uh, I would say watch this space and see what happens. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay. We have Eric Brown who wants to come forward. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Have Thank you. Bye. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, the state of California uh, has invested over $10 million in the development of a statewide telehealth network. I am the president of the California Telehealth Network. It's based in Sacramento. It was started by UC Davis back in 2010. Um, and really was formed up as a independent 501c3 to support telehealth adoption and implementation in rural and safety net clinics and hospitals all over the state. Um, since that time, we have worked with over 300 clinics and hospitals around the state of California from Alturas to Calexico and everything in between. We provide broadband connectivity that's uh, subsidized by the FCC. Uh, we also operate uh, the state's Telehealth Resource Center, which is funded by HRSA. HRSA funds 12 regional telehealth resource centers. California is the only state that has its own because of our, our size and the number of providers in the state. Uh, and their role is to go out and help any uh, health care provider in the state, uh, whether they're safety net, private, health plans, you name it. If they're interested in uh, finding out more about telemedicine and how it might help in their practice or as a health plan, that's what we do. So uh, I, I came today to hear Dr. Chaudhry's uh, presentation, and I'm happy to say I don't have anything to criticize him about. It was, it was on point. Uh, I would love the opportunity to come back and speak to the board about specifically California and what the trends are, because they are dramatic. We're seeing telemedicine. Uh, virtual consultations volumes uh, double every year since Medicaid expansion occurred in the state. Uh, the majority of this is telepsychiatry. Uh, over 70% of the consultations we see are some uh, are behavioral health related, uh, but we're also seeing them in various other disciplines. We have found ways to make sure that we only use HIPAA compliant partners and technologies. We uh, have been able to reduce the cost of using these technologies uh, by uh, leveraging our size. We're one of the largest statewide telehealth networks in the country. Uh, and I'd love the opportunity to come back and tell you more. I got three minutes here, so there's only so much I can say. 
I just wanted you to be aware that uh, you can be proud of the fact that the state has invested in bringing this organization forward. Please use us as a resource. We're a nonprofit. All we care about in our mission is using technology to expand access to care. Thank you. Do we have any additional comments in the audience? I'm Dr. Peter Bratton, um, and three years ago I was, for six solid years, uh, one of the early adopters of uh, telemedicine in rural uh, Northern California. I was um, on the staff of nine different hospitals, six of which I was the only urologist, and four had uh, telemedicine robot uh, capability, and I was able to do um, surgeries and follow up on my patients. Also did um, telemedicine through the state uh, prison system, saving uh, transportation of many prisoners, which required two to three guards, um, and in that alone was a huge cost savings. I think um, as state of California, we're fortunate that on your board here, we have two physicians that are actually experienced in telemedicine, and with Mr. Brown, I'm excited uh, to have um, Watsonville Community Hospital participate in that telemedicine. Telemedicine um, is not telehealth, and I think uh, that is a task that the State Medical Board should be aware of. Um, the question um, that Dr. Krauss brought up, uh, about um, uh, tel uh, corporations um, bringing on tele ads in medicine um, should be overseen by the State Medical Board. The standard of care should not ever be a sacrifice. We have good studies. We have good journals in telemedicine. Uh, State of Iowa has their um, whole prison um, uh, system covered with urology via telemedicine and has uh, enjoyed uh, cost savings of two to three visits per year, not having to transport uh, those patients in that state. Um, so I think um, with these challenging things and we being in the midst of Silicon Valley, um, we can expect a lot of things growing here, but I, um, I enjoy uh, the opportunity to work directly with the board and making sure that the patient is always centric in the deliverance of uh, tele telemedicine. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments in the audience? Are there any comments on the phone? Yes. There is a comment from Susan Lauren. Go ahead, Susan. Um, hi. I also tried to comment on the last uh, topic, and I had pushed star one, and I didn't get through, so I don't know if I'll have a chance to do that. Um, I'm concerned about this because the standards of care already stink, and we know that because I was surgically assaulted, lots of friends that I know were, and nothing is being done. So this is just going to unless you deal with the problems that you've got right now, um, one of the main things I keep telling you about is that patients need to approve their records, whether you're doing teleconference or not, because my records are fabricated, and most people who have experienced medical malpractice explain that their records are fabricated and changed. So you need to deal with that bottom line. Also, I'm, I'm concerned about whether plastic surgeons are going to do this, because there's a site called Real Self online, that, um, for instance, I can't even get a review up because they are biased. They only let up the kind of reviews that they want to let up. And someone like um, Dr. Kenneth Hughes goes on and looks at a person without seeing them in person. And, you know, for my situation, you can be extremely fit and have some skin ketosis and not have the desire or need to have fat taken from you, and a guy can mutilate you alive and then blame it on you. Um, so there's a, there was a thin, a slim young woman who said she, she worked out and ate well, and uh, people in person told her not to get liposuction, and um, Kenneth Hughes came on and he said, that's a quote right here, uh, your physique looks good, but I could still remove two liters or so from, from I could still remove two liters or so. So, um, you know, fat is an endocrine organ, and if we're, if we're making this available with these plastic surgeons just looking at people, not even 
taking, not even being with them in person, I see a lot of danger there. And I, I don't want to see this. I'm trying to right now get, get the plastic surgeon to stop hurting people in person, and that's not happening. So, of course, you can see my concern. Um, if I have one more sec, I'll tell you about the last comment. Um, I agreed with the woman that talked about either trauma work or I would say for the doctors who are stressed. Um, I was a licensed massage therapist for 25 years, and a lot of um, medical personnel were my uh, clients, and they did very well. And they said that they, this was the best thing in their life. We did movement therapy, we did meditation, and we did massage therapy. Those are very real and also um, good nutrition. Um, so rather than, you know, going to giving them psychiatric drugs or, or things like that, I really... You know, it's going to be a whole different discussion, but the whole field of medicine, I believe, needs to be based as much as it can in doing no harm and starting with lifestyle. And, and also, as far as the record of the medical board and referring people to them, um, you, ha you didn't do anything against the surgical assault case. Okay. Well, you didn't take my question before. I don't know why. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? Our next comment comes from Kenwar Gill. Go ahead, Kenwar. Well, my name is Kenwar Gill. I'm calling from Fresno. And I would want to mention that, you know, a key component of telemedicine has not been discussed, which is real use scenarios, uh, corrections being one of them, critical access being one of them. In these cases, we've seen that uh, uh, telemedicine actually serves as an extension of a physician exam room when a physician is present on one end. Um, uh, the distant site, and when a nurse or a medical assistant is presenting physician, uh, patient at the other end, usually a state prison or a critical access hospital. I mean, these are the cases where it does have a valid uh, um, use. But, you know, what Dr. Chaudhry has been trying to sell us is direct-to-consumer telemedicine with a front-facing camera, GPS-enabled location, uh, labeled cell phone with a stereo headphone or a stereo microphone. Um, you know, these are the things that really need to be uh, looked at closely. California cannot have two standard of care, one for an iPhone 10 and one for a physician exam room. I mean, use of peripherals, autoscopes, ophthalmoscopes, uh, stethoscopes are key components when medical boards, expert reviewers look for the completeness of the visit of the exam. Um, I mean, why would a medical board discipline a physician for not able to comment on a uh, color and consistency of a nasal discharge versus a telemedicine guy from Stanford seeing a patient from Fresno on a front-facing camera gets away scot-free. Uh, he also mentioned Federation of State Medical Board Smart Group, which uh, provided the current telemedicine policy, but he failed to mention the subject matter expert. Elizabeth Hall was from WellPoint, an insurance company. Alexis Gilroy was from Jones Doe, um, an attorney firm that was representing the telemedicine uh, company at the time. Roy Schoenberg, he's the president, CEO, and founder of American Well Systems. And American Well is a key technology supplier to uh, Anthem, to other people like, you know, Doctor on Demand. And these companies have actually bought these products, health system buy from American Well. So the subject matter experts who drafted the model policy of telemedicine had vested interest in drafting those policies and Dr. Dr. John Thomas, who is the chair, has basically no rule. He's just sitting signing some papers. Um, then we also have to see the good faith exam is a condition of establishing a doctor-patient relationship. Direct to consumer telemedicine doesn't provide. And the business and profession code is actually lagging behind. Recently, uh, Senate Bill 275 was put into the uh, Business and Profession Committee by Senator Pan, and it was opposed by none other than the California Assembly members. They said that we cannot make changes uh, to the Business and Profession co Code for just the psychologist or the behavioral health therapist, and all he was asking was to provide for prohibition against sexual behavior under the current Business and Profession Code, a sexually explicit text message or a picture does not constitute a ground for revocation. The need to fix the business and profession code before you fix the telemedicine situation. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? And there are no further questions on the phone. Great. 
So at this moment, before we move to um, agenda item 11, so we're going back to yesterday's schedule, we're gonna take a 15 minute break. So we're gonna return back at 1230 in order to allow some of the members to check out and probably some of the people in the audience to check out as well. Okay, thank you. Board meeting. We're moving to next item on the agenda, which is item 11, update on the Health Professions Education Foundation. Dr. Hawkins. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. A copy of my comments provided in a handout. Uh, my narrative may deviate in sequence, but not in the content. Uh, the Health Professions Education Foundation Board met two days ago in Sacramento. I'm one board member of California who, who serves on that board. Now for background, Health Professional Education Foundation is a nonprofit 501c3 organization housed within the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, OSHPAD. It was established to improve access to health care and other surveyors of California by providing scholarship and loan repayment programs to health profession students and graduates who are committed to providing health care services. In return for HPEF support, awarded recipients agreed to provide services in medically owned surveyors of California for a period of one to three years. The foundation administers this program from six funds established by the California State Legislature. So I'm just give you some of the uh, background uh, about what's happened in the last year. So, um, and you may see this in your handout if you have it. So in 50 year 2018-19, HPEF awarded a total of 256 loan repayment and scholarship awards. Of the 256 awards, 236 payment awards are granted to Allied Health, Nursing, Licensed Mental Health Professions, and Physician. The remaining awards are granted to 20 nursing students. Total amount awarded was $6.4 million. Uh, the HPEF loan repayment application cycle is now open for those entities I just mentioned, except for physicians. The application cycle opened August 1st, 2019, closes October 8, 2019. It's accepting applications for allied health, nursing, and licensed mental health professionals. Applicants are encouraged to join a technical assistance call to ask questions about the program and also receive help with their application. For more information about all aspects of the application process, you can visit www.healthprofessions, with an S, healthprofessions.ca.gov. A special, the Stephen M. Thompson Physician Corps Loan Repayment Program, STLRP, for fiscal, fiscal year 2018, 2018-19 rather, um, awarded a total of 45, oops, excuse me, uh, awarded a total of uh, $4.4 million for 45 physicians. Um, enclosed in this update is a map of the counties where the 45 awardees provide the direct patient care. So the next STLRP application cycle opens December 2nd, will close February 21st, 2020. Uh, HPF always needs volunteers to help in scoring the STLRP application beginning in early April. And I participate in this essential scoring of applicants, very, very important. Uh, please contact HPF if interested. Same website, www helpprofessions.ca.gov. I want to highlight a couple other things relative to HPEF. Uh, uh, the governor's budget for fiscal year 2019-2020 approved $1 million general fund to award former foster youth under the licensed mental, health, mental services provider education program. HPEF is currently uh, accepting applications from licensed mental health professionals who are foster youth. The governor's budget also approved $46 million to support existing Health, uh, mental health loan repayment programs. I also want to bring to your attention, you may be aware, uh, two charitable contribution community investment program. These are related to mergers between, uh, um, one was CVS and Aetna. So in November 15, 2018, California Department of Health Care announced its approval of the health plan merger between CVS and Aetna. As part of the merger community benefit requirement, HPF scholarships and loan repayment programs receive a community investment of 28.8 million over three years. 
to increase the number of health care and mental health professionals in underserved areas. So this community investment will provide $7.6 million per year over a three-year period and specifies that at least $2 million per year will be designated for scholarships and $5.6 million per year will be designated to loan repayment programs. The other uh, mergers, Cigna and Express Scripts, same department managed health care uh, announced approval of this merger and a concept of that merger um, HPF scholarship and loan repayment programs will receive a community investment of $10 million to increase the number of health care and mental health professionals in underserved communities. Uh, Two millions per year over a five-year period, specifies at least 500,000 per year be designated for scholarships, 1.5 million designated for loan repayment programs. Uh, HPF has social media for information on loan repayment application cycles and upcoming application cycles. Please visit HPF's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, which are all in the handout. Uh, thank you very much. I would encourage you, encourage you as, as I am, to talk to institutions who may benefit from these loan repayment programs um, uh, and scholarships to increase uh, service to uh, those underserved areas of California. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. You're welcome. Are there any questions or comments from members? Are there any public comments in the audience? Any comments on the phone? There are currently no comments on the phone. Okay. Moving to the next agenda item, which is item 12, discussion and possible action on appointment of a member to the Health Professionals Education Foundation. The Health Professions Education Foundation improves access to health care and underserved areas of California by providing scholarships and loan repayments, as Dr. Hawkins has already um, mentioned, um, the programs to health professional students and graduates who are dedicated to providing direct patient care in those areas. In return for this support, recipients agree to provide direct patient care in medically underserved areas of California for a period of one to two to three years. The board needs to appoint another member to serve along Dr. Hawkins on the HPATH board. Dr. Gananadev has shown an interest in being on this foundation. Can I have a motion to approve Dr. Ganadev um, to be appointed as a member of the Health Professions Education move. Foundation? I will so move that recommendation. A second? A second. Great. Are there any comments or questions from the members? Okay. Are there any public comments? Are there any comments on the phone? There are currently no comments on the phone. Great. First, I want to um, thank Ms. Lawson because she's also been on this um, foundation for her service and thanking Dr. Hawkins for his continued service on this board. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Ms. Cruz Jones, please call the roll. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Gonadev? Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Aye. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Mr. Watkins? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Thank you, Dr. Gananadev. <laughs> <laughs> we have more work for you to do so we're going to really go out of order here um, because of uh, time limitations we have some members and, um, and people in the audience who are to speak that have flights um, we want to make sure people are able to get to the airport timely and, and, and make their flights so we're going to move to agenda item 23 Discussion and possible action to amend Title 16, California Code of Regulations, Section 1366.3, 1366.31, and 1379.07 regarding administration of training for medical assistance and approved medical and midwife assistant certifying organizations. Ms. Webb. Thank you, members. Uh, first, when we talk about medical assistance and midwife assistance, I want to remind everyone that they uh, do not have to be certified to provide technical supportive services in California. 
they do not have to go to school as the law allows them to be trained on the job. Some entities and practices may require as part of their hiring criteria that medical and midwife assistants be certified. If they do require certification, California law does not require that certifying organization be approved by the medical board unless that medical assistant or midwife assistant will be training other medical or midwife assistants. The law currently requires that uh, those organizations that certify medical and midwife assistants be nonprofit tax exempt. The National Health Career Association wants to be approved by the medical board as a certifying organization, but they are a for profit organization. So the board received a rulemaking petition to strike the requirement that medical and midwife, well, they focused on medical assistant organiz certifying organizations be nonprofit, uh, contending that entity status as a nonprofit tax exempt organization bears no relationship to the quality of the certifying organization. Instead, the petitioner states that requiring each organization to obtain accreditation from the National Commission for Certifying Agencies, as well as undergoing psychometric program evaluations, would be a better indicator of quality. The board approved the rulemaking in concept at a prior board meeting, but asked staff to provide information on whether there would be cost implications to medical and midwife assistants if this change were approved. After reviewing several nonprofit and for-profit medical assistant certifying organizations, it appears that an organization's nonprofit status does not necessarily mean it will be less expensive than for-profit organizations. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, structures to these things. Some entities require membership. There's different time periods for recertification. Uh, some of the membership fees include costs of continuing education and some don't. So it, it really varies and there's not a way to say that nonprofit means less expensive. That did not bear out. Uh, but Nonprofit organizations do have disclosure requirements, and, and that is a difference that uh, members of this board brought up. But this board does approve for-profit medical schools, and so that is something to take into consideration that, that for something as significant as medical schools, the board has not required them to be nonprofit. And in fact, in 2020, there will be less of a barrier for international medical schools to be approved. In light of this, staff has proposed changes to uh, sections 16 CCR, section 1366.3 and 1379.07 related to certifying organizations and also a corresponding change to section 1366.3 regarding the administrative administration of training for medical assistance <clears throat> and this is to um, update the language because there have been some changes to oversight agencies to um, statutory sections and it was a, a good time to streamline that and reference it in the, the section of the certifying uh, regulation. So I am happy to walk through each and every change that I have suggested um, or to leave it to members to ask questions if they have any. I was I would suggest you um, highlight the ones that are really critical okay okay 
So in the administration of changing, like I said, the, the key here is that there have been uh, shifts in responsibility for oversight agencies and it hadn't been updated in a while. Mm -hmm. And so that has been shifted and correct code sections have been updated. That covers that. For uh, approved certifying organizations, the change will be to add in the requirement that they provide documentation showing that they are um, uh, accredited by the National Commission for Certifying Agencies. I would like to note that that already is a requirement for our midwife assistant certifying organizations. Um, and they are an accrediting agency that is used throughout California statutes and regulations. They are a respected body. Uh, we would strike the requirement that they be nonprofit tax exempt and to um, streamline what the board is requiring them to look for in applicants, I've striked duplicative language and referred back to the administration of changing administration of training sections that are relevant. The other piece is that we do have um, some currently recognized organizations that I am told are going through the process of being accredited mm -hmm. by the NCCA and uh, they do need time to complete that. And so I've put in a deadline of January 1st, 2027 for them to be accredited and demonstrate that so that their approval can be continued by the board. Okay, so okay now the, the motion has to be particular and that okay. is to um, direct staff to prepare the rulemaking documents. I'll, I'll restate it. Uh, I move to uh, have staff prepare the necessary regulatory documents to submit to the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. I'll share. The motion is to uh, direct staff to prepare the necessary regulatory documents to submit to the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency uh, upon DCA and the agency approval to submit the documents to the Office of Administrative Law to notice the proposed regulatory language to amend the following regulations. Title 16 California Code of Regulations CCR sections 1366.3, 1366.31, and 1379.07 and to authorize the staff to make non-substantive changes to the language and respond to non-substantive comments during the rulemaking process without returning to the board. Second, I don't have to read all that. So. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments from the members? <clears throat> just, uh, just a comment that uh, it is the right thing to do. I, LCME, which accredits MD Medical School, did that. They took that not for profit away because they were concerned that they are potentially putting themselves at uh, a legal risk. And Medicare took that off. Remember the hospital accrediting agencies, there are a couple of for-profits along with a couple not-for-profits, so we're doing the right thing. Mr. Watkins? So my question is, yeah, it's good to take it out, but that's the, you know, the board as a public protection mandated agency or board. That is when we go to the for-profit model. I have a lot of experience that, and I also have experience in the non-profit part of it. And we go to the nonprofit model when we don't want to have that level of public scrutiny or the disclosures that is required. So I have a suggestion. If we can require, and I mean this is moving forward, as is everyone say, everybody's moving in this direction, but it's moving to the for profit model that has less disclosures. So you cannot really pierce that corporate veil if there is any questions that we will. The public wants to ask downstream. So my suggestion is that if you bring up an amendment that asks for uh, something like an equivalent disclosure or something close to an equivalent disclosure, 
then you put the, then they can have the non-profit status, but they also bring in a public, the, uh, public protection or public transparency aspect to it. And I know it's easy to move to a for-profit model if we all want that. But since that is, for me, it's not a, it's the public protection mandate, the transparency that goes with that downstream if it uh, is allowed to be president, president, is that no one will get access to disclosure information. That's the corporate veil. And I'm just concerned about that. So that's my question and suggestion. Well, we, we don't do it in other much more significant contexts. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, number two, if we get the disclosure we wouldn't do anything with it. Um, that's why it makes sense to have a respected accrediting agency that is looking at how they're running their program and having to meet certain requirements uh, help the board with that deep dive function. Thank that's you. That's my response. I can answer the same one. Same thing. CMS looks at all the joint commission and all the for profits. All of them, their their financials, their workloads, everything. So and so does uh, LCME looks at every medical school. There is only one for profit school in the country, which is in Sacramento. Uh, but you have to submit everything to the accrediting agency, not to us. Okay. We have comments from um, the public. John Perez. Good afternoon, Chair Pines, members. I'm John Perez. I'm the former Speaker of the California Assembly, and I'm here to support the item that you're currently considering requiring, uh, striking the requirement for nonprofit status. At the heart of this really are the assumptions that we ascribe to nonprofit versus for-profit institutions. And at the heart of it is really a question of what gets you the best evaluation uh, to protect the interests of the professions that we're trying to regulate and to protect the public. Uh, during my tenure as speaker, we looked at many of these issues and we looked to strive uh, to look at them with fresh, uh, fresh eyes where we could remove unnecessary obstacles. And I think that what your staff has done is really a very good cut at looking at accreditation from other bodies and to look at psychometric standards and making sure that we didn't use proxies uh, to take the place of that which ensures that we're looking out for the interest of the public. In fact, the staff analysis has shown that nonprofit status, as you've heard, has no bearing on the price uh, to the prospective medical assistant. Data shows that better indicators of quality uh, certifying organization is accreditation by a third party, as has been mentioned. And I'm encouraged to see that the staff also included uh, these considerations in their recommendations. Many institutions and agencies have been moving away from using nonprofit versus for-profit as the proxy indicator, opting instead to look at indicators as like the ones you've included in evaluating uh, ideal outcomes. Changing this role as is proposed would uh, help prospective uh, professionals in the state by allowing a wider range of high quality certification processes. And so I wanted to applaud the uh, staff's work in this area and tell you how encouraged I am by the discussion that the board has had as well. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your public service. Jessica Langley. Ms. Pines and board members, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jessica Langley. I'm the Executive Director of Education and Advocacy for the National Health Career Association. Um, I'm speaking today not only on behalf of NHA, but also as a allied health, a certified allied health professional, practitioner, and educator with about 20 years experience across the field. 
NHA works with educators and employers, not only in California but across the country, to provide not only accredited certification exams in eight different allied health professions, but we also offer other preparation resources, um, study guides, training resources to elevate the level of competency and skill of allied health professionals. NHA, our mission statement is to empower people to access a better future. And as an industry leader, we feel it's our responsibility to students and to professionals to provide them the necessary tools and resources that allow them to be competent in their field of study and profession. We support allied health career workers and their aspirations not only in their education phase, but also through certification and post-certification through professional development and continuing education offerings as well. We um, also provide robust data analytics and reporting to our customers, meaning that could be educators, employers, physicians, or health systems, to also help um, with on-the-job training or continued learning or professional development to track areas of weakness for skills enhancements um, and also competency assurance as well to ensure that we are providing the uh, necessary level of high-quality patient care to all Californians. We are in support of the proposed amendments regarding the administration of training to medical assistance and approved certifying agencies. The proposed change will ensure that organizations that certify medical assistance are accredited and offer high quality medical assistance certification programs. The current regulation mandates that a certifying organization be a nonprofit, tax exempt organization, but not, does not otherwise certify or ensure that other quality uh, medical assistant training or certification. Rather, it appears that the nonprofit tax exempt status was used for a proxy to ensure that the certifying agency is le legitimate um, and dedicated to the assessment. We think that this is a poor proxy and that the third party accreditor would allow them to um, show higher standards within their, their certification programs. The National Commission for Certifying Agencies is a division of the Institute for Credentialing Excellence. It is an independent accreditor that provides impartial third-party validation that a program meets national credentialing industry standards for the development, implementation, and maintenance of certification programs. NCCA requires programs holding its accreditation to provide annual reports, submit to audits whenever they require them, and to apply for reaccreditation every five years. Please conclude. Each program is required to have an independent certify, certifying body or governing board made up of industry st stakeholders and subject matter experts. If any currently approved bodies are not accredited, the board could allow a grace period as mentioned during which such certifying bodies may obtain that accreditation. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy? Uh, good afternoon, um, this is the board. Um, my name is Cindy Ui, and I am working with Dr. Nieto. I am his accreditation director for a Health Career College, which is located in Pleasant Hill. Uh, it's been in um, use, or it was created or established in 2003, and we actually have three of the um, areas that uh, NHA has where we go for certification from them and that's the phlebotomy um, EKG and medical assisting and uh, I was very pleased to find out the changes that you've made I will go back and look further through it um, and, but our big thing was that uh, we really have been working very close with NHA. They do a review of all their uh, uh, testing skills every so often, and I've just been very thrilled because when folks don't pass their accreditations, uh, I felt that it was uh, very much deserved, and the ones that did pass, they did. So the folks that didn't, they'd go back and review and then take it again. And when they take it again, it's a different test altogether. So it's testing different areas of what they have. But I just wanted to say that what an awesome job NHA has been doing. I've been working very closely with uh, Maggie, who's our representative with NHA, and um, just they've been doing a great job. Was there anything else here? Um, no, I'll go there. So thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Dave Mosier. Good 
Good afternoon. I'd just like to talk just a couple minutes about commerce. Commerce is the exchange of goods and services between two or more entities. When, um, um, when you have a commercial transaction, you have a contract, and a contract becomes law. There's several types of laws. There's universal law, gravity. Underneath that comes a uniform commercial code. That's international law, what 192 nations use. Underneath that comes common law. Like some of you who have kids, you go by a school, you see that white flag there with a bear on it, and it says California Republic. Let's say the state of California. It's a common law. Uh, underneath that comes the uh, federal, and then comes state, and then trickles on down to um, political law, such as uh, real estate, which I am a real estate broker. Your membership there is also considered political law, too. Um, when you look at law, um, you're looking at something a little bit different than what you might hear in legalese or legals. Legalese are like rules, regulations. They kind of, um, kind of, uh, it can diminish law. I'll give you an example. Uh, some of you might have a favorite sports car. Let's just use Ferrari for an example. Ferrari can go maybe 180 miles an hour. That's about the length of uh, three track homes every second. In, uh, anybody ever hear of the Autobahn in Germany? The speed limit in the Autobahn is unlimited. That is actually law of the world. Can't get any uh, faster than ultimate. When you have a, a school zone, you got about 25 miles an hour is the normal thing. We stop that Ferrari from going 180 miles an hour, or three homes every single second, not only to protect his car, but protect the balls, the kids, the bicycles, and the whole environment around there. It's okay to have restrictions in the, in the form of rules. Um, that's fine. It's, just, it's in best interest. Uh, my only concern uh, about um, when you get into um, uh, using the legalese is sometimes decisions are made by public policy and not necessarily public law. And that's just something that you might want to consider when you make choices in your field. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments in the audience? Any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the phone at this time. Ms. Cruz-Jones, please call the roll. Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Ganadev. Yes. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Dr. Thorpe. Aye. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Mr. Watkins. No. And Ms. Pines. Aye. We're going to move to agenda item 20, update discussion and possible action of recommendations from the Midwifery Advisory Committee meeting. Ms. Holzier. Good afternoon. My name is Diane Holzer. I'm the current chair of the Midwifery Advisory um, Council. So our requested action for the following agenda items are discussion on establishing goals in 2019 for the MAC, um, updates on midwifery-related legislation, selection of chair for the MAC, selection of a vice chair, presentation on the California Association of Licensed Midwives survey regarding physician refusal to provide care for midwifery clients, Report from the MAC Chair, update on the midwifery program, and the LMAR data presentation for the year. The background, our last meeting was held on March 7th, 2019, and at this meeting, the following actions were taken, and we were provided with information as well. We um, approved the administration procedures manual for the MAC. We selected three new members to the MAC. We elected a vice chair. We made decisions on our uh, 2019 meeting dates. We heard an update on midwifery legislation and on the midwifery program and an update on the LMAR report, annual report. Thank you. Thank you. 
Can I have a motion to approve the agenda for the next midwifery council meeting? Also move to approve the agenda. Can I have a second? Second. Are there any questions, comments from the members? No. Are there any comments from the public and the audience? Any on the phone? No comments on the phone at this time. Ms. Cruz Jones? Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Gronadev? Abstain, I wasn't there for the entire presentation. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Mr. Watkins? Aye. And Ms. Pines? Aye. Thank you. We're going to move with, uh, we're going to move to the next agenda item, bringing Ms. Webb back. Item 24, discussion and possible action to amend 1320 and 1321 of the regulations. All right, members, uh, many of you have seen uh, 16 CCR section 1320 and 1321 before. Uh, board staff have been working with DCA and the Office of Administrative Law. And in light of the uh, length of the review process, we had overlapping rulemaking packages moving through the process. Uh, following discussions with DCA and the Office of Administrative Law staff has pulled back those two rulemaking packages and combined them into one and made additional changes. The biggest change is that the prior rulemaking made amendments to allow the board to give credit for applicants who went to postgraduate training accredited by the American Osteopathic Association that had reached initial or pre-accreditation status with the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education, ACGME. Uh, staff has been in contact with the AOA and confirmed that MDs are not going into these postgraduate training programs until they are fully accredited by ACGME. And so it took this issue that we anticipated was going to be a problem with being able to approve qualified applicants, and it is not an issue. And so we are taking that out of the proposed rulemaking and uh, making some additional clarifying changes that will bring Section 1320 and 1321 up to speed with our uh, statutes that have changed the postgraduate training program, program requirements from one to two to the three years for everybody. So under uh, 1320, you'll see that we've sh struck out the two-year exemption period, made it 39 months, that is for everybody made some uh, additional clarifying changes for uh, typo and brought up to speed our authorizing statutes. And then in 1321, uh, we are clarifying that postgraduate training programs located in the US, its territories in Canada that are accredited by the accreditors we rely on will be approved. Uh, updating, again, our statutory authorizations based on our new postgraduate training requirements. Took out the AOA references because it's not necessary and struck out the um, discussion on being formally admitted as being a requirement. It's not necessary with our new changes because there will be a, a form that will be provided by the training programs and um, made conforming changes so that the at least 24 continuous months out of the required 36 months will be in one program but that period uh, 
can be interrupted due to hardship or illness. So that is keeping it the, with what we currently allow, but updating the period required. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Ms. Webb. So can I have a motion to direct staff to submit the proposed regulations for approval and once approved, formally notice those regulations and to authorize staff to make any non-substantive changes to the language and respond to non-substantive comments during the rulemaking process without returning to the board. Can I get a motion? So moved. A second? Okay, great. <laughs> Are there any comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the phone at this time. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones? Ms. Friedman? Yes. Dr. Ganadev? Hi. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Yes. M Mr. Watkins? Aye. And Ms. Pines? Aye. Okay, moving to agenda item 22. Discussion and possible action on the policy regarding utilization of experts, Ms. Kirschmeyer and Ms. Webb. Thank you, members. Uh, please turn to agenda item 22 and the memo provided by staff. As indicated in this memo, the board currently has a policy that it cannot use an expert reviewer more than three or five times per year. As you can imagine, in some specialties, this causes problems. In addition, it limits the use of experts who are qualified and educated in the enforcement process and provides reports that are well-reasoned, well-written, provide, provided in the correct format, and more expeditious. As stated in the memo, this was actually a recommendation that was given to the board from an outside consultant who reviewed the board's enforcement process. He stated that under the current board policy, medical experts may not be used, and this is a quotation from him, uh, may not be used more than three times per year. As with medical procedures, medical experts tend to become more qualified as they complete more reviews. However, under current policy, at the very point when the medical expert becomes, may become most qualified and also faster and more effective, they must stop work until another year. As defense counsel are under no such restrictions under the current system, the investigators and prosecutors are severely handicapped." End quote. Therefore, it is the board's staff recommendation that the board eliminate this policy. The board would still limit the use of experts to ensure all experts learn the process, but it would not be hindered by the policy itself. Based upon discussions with Health Quality Investigation Unit and the Attorney General's Office, board staff believes this will assist in improving the board's enforcement process. And Carrie, anything to add? No. And, and this is just really something over time we've identified that this is a concern of the board and I think that we need to move forward. And so with that, I would actually ask for a motion to um, eliminate this policy of expert utilization. So moved. Second. Great. Are there any questions or comments from the members? Yes. Please hold. I'm, I'm wondering if there's anyone here who was around when the policy was created to limit it to three uh, per year and, and what the motivation was at that time. Unfortunately, I was here. Um, <laughs> telling my age. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, at the time, it was actually um, way back in the day. It wasn't. It wasn't with the current staffing at the the California Medical Association. It was prior um, staffing that attend our board meetings, and from their perspective at the time, and and uh, in discussion with the board, it was that you you'd have individuals that they thought were one sided towards the board because they were over utilizing them over and over again, and actually at the time. 
it really was probably just an a expert that actually could provide a well-reasoned, well-educated, and could testify well in court. And so at the time, they had brought these issues to the medical board, and the medical board said, well, let's not, you know, use that. It's, it, you know, there's, there's terms out in the, the field as to how that overutilization of, of um, experts, you know, kind of moves forward. Um, for us, we always want an unbiased uh, and very um, objective report from our expert. And so that's what we'd be looking at in these individuals anyway. Um, that's something that, quite frankly, that can be brought up during the process of it going to hearing. That's something that the defense counsel could use, that, you know, this individual, they can bring that up during their argument. Um, but that's kind of, Dr. Krauss, where it had originally came from back in the day. Are there any additional questions? Yes, Dr. Mamou. So have we looked into the specialties, how many specialties are there where we have very scarce number of experts? Because most of the complaints and most of the issues are from very common specialties. And I think to limit the review process to just few people is going to create more bias. So leave it open. But look in the specialties where there is, we really need something, make an exemption. That will be more fair and transparent process. So if you if you look at your agenda packet under um, enforcement, I mean, under tab 10B, it talks about all of the utilization of experts. It's listed in there if you look at your packet. And it has all of the specialties where there are fewer specialties, ones that are where there's more. Um, it really is an overall process, though. You, you, it should be a, applied to all of them. I don't think that there's any difference in specialty um, when we're looking at this. But we'd still want to have as many experts as we can so the only way you can have more experts that are going to be able to do a good job is to keep them all in the system so it it's not like we're going to all of a sudden be using for for let's say internal medicine we're not going to use three experts to do all of the cases we have in internal medicine we're still going to do that it's just in some of those areas we want to have that flexibility to use it so i, w I wouldn't limit it to one because we never know which specialty you're going to have more experts in gotcha. and there's just Thanks. not a good reason to have an artificial limitation when if there's concerns about bias that's addressed at the hearing that has less of an impact I think when you're talking about a hearing before an administrative law judge versus a jury um, and I think the the Attorney General's office will be sensitive to this and know how to handle it and there's just not a good reason to have an artificial barrier uh, it, it should be more open. Okay. Are there any additional questions from the members? Okay. Ms. Ree? Uh, yes, hello. So if there were, I am someone that um, had been uh, observed by two uh, medical experts with the medical board. And the first one um, definitely had a racial bias. And so if there's a racial bias with the medical expert that the board sends me to, how are you going to know about it? Unless someone like me speaks about it. So the medical expert, the psychiatrist that the board sent me to, saw only cash patients, never contracted Medicare, Medicaid, had never been on any kind of diversity board or had any background training or education in racial and ethnic and financial diversity and hardships. He, and he only testified for the medical board. He didn't testify for defendants. Same with the medical expert of family medicine. My cases were internal medicine but the board could not find an internal medicine specialist to speak um, against my, my cases. And so they had to get a family medicine doctor who was not board certified. He was not board certified. And as soon as he got up on the stand, he complained because he was no longer able to be um, a volunteer doctor for the SWAT team because his premiums went up because of the um, the Black Lives Matter Sacramento um, situation, his premiums went up and he was no longer, and he was upset and blamed it on Black Lives Matter Sacramento because his premiums went up and he could no longer be a physician for the SWAT team. And he was a gentleman who only, and so there's your bias. And what did that result in? I'm revoked. And the administrative law judge would not allow the psychiatric testimony from our expert. 
So if these things happen, how are you going to know about it? How are you going to hear about it? Please, in the interest of patients, the diverse patients that we treat, we really have to focus on the medical experts that the medical board is hiring, is paying for. They have to see a racially diversified patient population, have had experience in diversity um, in, in their education or in their background. It can't just be a lot of awards and board certifications and um, a volunteer a physician for the SWAT team. <laughs> so when that bias occurs, how are you going to know? And if, it, if I was not here to tell you this and you utilize the same medical experts over and over again, how are you going to know? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? We do have one comment on the phone. Ms. Susan Lauren, your line is now open. Hi, thank you. As you can imagine, this is a big topic for me. In the Hughes case, attorneys from both sides said the plastic surgery expert for your board was corrupt and lied profusely. I provided clear evidence that proves beyond a reasonable certainty that Saul Berger surgically, surgically battered me, so ditto for my case. I object to your expert, Dr. Terry Dubrow. He perjured himself under sworn testimony in my depot and trial. I have the transcripts that show his false witness and unprofessional conduct and have sent you the details for years through correspondence with your board. Among other things, Dubrow said that Berger did not operate on my buttocks, but in fact, Dr. Berger made numerous lipoincisions on my gluteus and removed it for no reason and destroyed my body against need to send to rationale. Dubrow spun mutilation as skin laxity, age, or a mental problem. He said there was no permanent damage or pain. In contrast, plastic surgeon Dr. Bratner and many, many others said the damage wasn't skin laxity or age. It was extremely poor technique. Procedures were contraindicated, and Berger's acts are surgical assault and caused permanent damage. Terry Dubrow uses his position as a reviewer with the medical board and used it in my case to unjustly sway my jury. Dubrow and attorney McAndrews told my jury repeatedly that Dubrow was the standard for the medical board as they spouted lies and slander. In the exit poll, jurors said they went with Dubrow because of his position with your board. Dubrow has worked repeatedly with McAndrews. I hold your board responsible for me losing my case because you enable and empower Terry Dubrow and let him testify in your name. I imagine many cases have been dismissed unjustly because of these people and people like them. And by the way, plastic surgeons cannot police themselves. They drink the same Kool-Aid about dangerous unscientific procedures such as liposuction that cause a lot of harm. It increases visceral fat. I've written the paper on it. I've showed you the paper. I've gotten you lots of testimonies from women if you've even read what I've ever sent to you. Dubrow cooperated with McAndrews in staging a corrupt case in court. And um, anyway, I think I've repeated myself. But at the end, uh, in the Nasser case, which I, which I think of a lot, he hired, Larry Nasser hired friends to say that his actions were appropriate. And as I began the day saying, the medical board is in a parallel role in my case as USA Gymnastics was with Larry Nasser. I don't know why you employ Terry Dubrow. Have you vetted him? Because I know lots of women harmed by him, and he was absolutely uh, he perjured himself and unprofessional, and he left me at risk for homelessness. So can you imagine my anger? That is not okay. It's not okay at all. And I want you to do something about it. And I'm going to stay on top of this. And I have every right to feel this anger. I was a healthy person and I was mutilated. And then this band of brothers comes together. Why would you employ this guy? Yeah, well, I, I really need to look at this. I'd like to revisit this with you. This can't go on. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? There are no additional comments at this time. Right. Ms. Cruz-Jones? Ms. Friedman? Dr. Gonadav? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Yes. Mr. Watkins? Aye. And Ms. Pines? Yes. 
Um, let's move to agenda item 27, election of officers. I would like to ask for nominations for secretary. Dr. Hawkins. Uh, nominate Dr. Howard Krause. Krause. I second that nomination. Okay. Nominations are now closed. Ms. Cruz Jones, please call the roll. Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Lewis. Yes, I. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Dr. Thorpe. Yes. Mr. Watkins. Yes. And Ms. Pines. Yes. Congratulations, Dr. Krause. Thank you. I would like to ask for nominations for vice president. Um, you know, the, the, the difficulty in doing your job well is you're asked to continue to do it. So I'd like to nominate Dr. Lewis. Do we have a second? second? Okay, great. Any other nominations? The nominations are closed. Ms. Cruz Jones? Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Dr. Thorpe. Yes. Mr. Watkins. Yes. And Ms. Pines. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. I would like to ask for nominations for president. Ms. Pines also made the tragic mistake of doing exceptionally well on our <laughs> behalf last year, and I'm honored to nominate her to be president for another year. Thank you. Third. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the nominations are now closed. Ms. Cruz Jones. Ms. Friedman. Yes. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Dr. Thorpe. Yes. Mr. Watkins. Yes. And Ms. Pines. Yes. Thank you again. And isn't it sunset coming yes. up? Yes. We're going to have fun. She and I are be, <laughs> We're going to have fun. We're going to be spending a lot of time with each other. <laughs> I'm now going to move to agenda okay. item 18. Update from the Attorney General's office. Ms. Castro. Good afternoon. Congratulations to everyone that just got reinstated or promoted, whatever the case may be. Uh, I'd also like to welcome the new board members. Uh, we're honored to serve you uh, in your important mission of public protection. And we are basically your law firm in the Attorney General's office. Um, you're one of the few DCA client agencies that actually have a law firm in our office uh, dedicated to you. And it allows uh, your cases to be dealt with by the most experienced people that only deal with your cases. Uh, we're a shop of in five cities uh, comprised of 60 lawyers, nine paralegals, and two analysts. And uh, for the new members of the medical board, um, you're also unlike other DCA agencies in that you have a statute of limitations to file your cases. And so I'd like to report that uh, our staff in Health Quality Enforcement Unit has assimilated into the handoff model of processing your completed investigations. And I would like to take the time to commend our excellent staff in the health quality enforcement section for their resiliency and flexibility in reviewing the evidence and drafting accusations, and sometimes under an intense amount of time pressures. We propose the disciplinary charges to you based on the investigation presented to us by the HQIU unit, your investigators. And uh, as Ms. Pines knows, uh, we have requested a six-month lead-in time as these cases are not matters sometimes that we're familiar with now that they're handoff cases. So we want to make sure to optimize um, the review of your voluminous and complex cases. And we proposed a six-month lead-in time 
to account for a statute of limitations that may be calculated by a non-attorney. And while every effort will always be made um, to file every meritorious case, we want enough time to be able to discuss these charges with the reviewing experts. They're what make or break the case. And we also want to provide our partners at the Health Quality Investigation Unit with enough time to use the cushion of six months to procure any additional missing evidence or procure expert testimony clarifications. HQE's industrious and committed staff works very uh, smartly on all matters to maintain the quality in meeting your high and, and clear and convincing burden of proof needed to, uh, to maintain the accusations against physicians. We also strive to meet your high expectations and also maintain our ethical obligations. And we're lucky to have a fantastic legal team on your side, the public protection side. And uh, we'd like to appreciate the leadership of Denise Pines and Dr. Lewis and of course our dear client, Kimberly Kirchmeyer. We met with them in May of 2019 and feel supported um, in uh, stressing the importance of this request that we uh, continue to operate as a team and to try and um, make sure we file what we need to file. Now with respect to costs, um, as you're aware, um, the cost went up. The cost used to be, um, for the new board members, uh, $170 for DAGs, Deputy Attorney Generals. Paralegals uh, used to bill at $120 an hour, and auditors and analysts uh, bill at, billed at $99. Um, this has increased, as you've noted, and um, I wanted to stress that there are costs that the medical board does not control. You do not control who sues you. When you get sued, we're your lawyers. And on top of that, we have sections in the office, the tort section, and our equal um, administrative mandate uh, folks sometimes pitch in. Uh, we also uh, hire internal experts. So if it's a correctional case, we may contact the correctional law section to get some help uh, in, in procuring those witnesses. Um, we also do not control when subpoena enforcements happen. What's a subpoena enforcement? It's when a doctor doesn't want to turn over records. Um, that's, that's the bottom line. So those types of cases can take a lot of money and time and energy, and that's a cost you do not control. You also don't control who appeals their decision, um, your decision to uh, impose probation, revoke them, or whatnot. Every physician in the state of California has a right to appeal. They have due process. So these writs and appeal matters have increased exponentially in the last seven years. Um, we have developed quite a great little practice in the health quality enforcement section uh, with staff that can do this. So we always take care to assign your cases to the person that we believe either has had that expertise or that really great result because they already know how to manage that particular case. So we have been hiring people that have a very strong civil litigation background so that nobody's reinventing wheels, nobody's paying to train them, they already can hit the ground running. Now on the issue of costs, this is a thing you can't control. You do not collect costs. You're one of the few if, that I know about uh, at the Department of Consumer Affairs that does not collect investigation costs nor prosecution costs. In 2006, you went to a cost neutral model with the investigators. So they don't bill you by the hour. You, it's a cost neutral and Ms. Kirchmeyer can speak to that. You also gave up the right to collect prosecution costs. The only prosecution costs that cannot be collected for all of my other clients are the couple of weeks that we're in trial. We do not collect those costs against respondents because they have a right to contest their case. Therefore, that's the only cost that is not recoverable. So in the past, it was very fun when I was a young deputy attorney general and joined the health quality enforcement section, like they say, time is money. So if we're not settling a case, guess what? I continue to bill and the costs go up. And if I win, the medical board gets to potentially request those costs either in a probation or after revocation, you can make it a condition precedent to return to the practice. So like they say, time is money. And the longer that a doctor is enabled to fight their case, the more time my staff spends on building and protecting your interests and making sure that the right result comes out. Uh, as noted, you, the last time you raised those licensing fees was in 2006, and that was to pay for the vertical enforcement program. And as has been noted, even though um, 
we've raised our fees and it will have an impact on you, the Office of Administrative Hearings is also raising their fees. Um, in the past, the use of our paralegals, uh, we had a handful of them. We always delegated to them some simpler tasks that we thought would create a savings to you. So if we had a default against a doctor, we would uh, have a paralegal manage that paper intensive uh, default at a reduce, reduce rate to you. Um, at the same time, we use them for discovery. So anything that uh, we're, when we're producing discovery, we have paralegals compile that. Why? Well, we don't want to use a lawyer to do that, but we do want to use a legal paraprofessional. And they also compile, compile trial notebooks, manage witnesses, and do all that. Another cost that you actually don't control, unfortunately, is the passage of SB 467. This is Business and Professions Code Section 312.2. It causes not only the Office of Administrative Hearings, but also the Attorney General's Office to produce an annual report. The BCP, the Budget Change Proposal for SB 467, called for the staffing of six paralegals. These paralegals use um, some of their time that they bill to you and to other clients uh, to be able to uh, make sure that the, the, the cases have the documentation necessary to be able to report that data. So that is a cost that has gone up, and that was imposed on you by the legislature, and really on us, but you're paying for it. Um, and so I know that I uh, look at the bills uh, very carefully, and um, we make very intelligent assignments. There's only so much we can do. We'd love to have input, and we can definitely uh, talk about how we can reduce your costs. if if there's a way to do it. But there are costs that are unavoidable, and you do want to win these cases. And so um, the elimination of vertical enforcement did not produce a savings in your budget because of this increase in the fees. Um, there has been a slight uh, downtick on the amount of hours that the lawyers are billing um, after vertical enforcement has gone down, but not as much as um, I think we anticipated. So uh, the next thing on my agenda uh, was just to update you on SB 1448. This is the probation notification statute in specific areas of discipline. I think we're working as a team uh, to be able to in identify cases in earnest that are going to require probation notification, either in settlement or at hearing, and then also helping out to uh, have discussions on how best the investigators can address those issues at the expert review level in the investigation phase that we're no longer involved with, but we're still very, very uh, motivated to make sure that, that that's handled in a very uh, methodical way so that those cases are staged properly to be able to put the public on notice. And I'm happy to report um, that I, we have new staff and so in June and July of 2019, we had um, four, four people join our office in Sacramento and San Diego. We had Veronica Juarez Vo. Uh, she's a seasoned prosecutor with a background in um, disability law and sexual assault. She came to us from the Yuba and Solano County District Attorney's Office. We also hired Aaron Lent. He's a seasoned prosecutor in felonies um, with expertise um, that is very deep. and. Um, he came to us from both the Stanislaus and Imperial County DA's office. We hired Mr. Lincoln, Robert Lincoln, out in our San Diego office. He's a jurist advocate general from the US Army, and he had legal experience in working for a medical technology firm. And finally, and this is to the point of um, how lucky we are to be able to attract fantastic staff that are, are willing to do this type of work because it is very, very um, difficult um, and it's underpaid, obviously, but he, Ryan McEwen, joined our Sacramento office. He has extensive civil litigation experience, specifically in complex antitrust actions in state and federal court, and he took a breathtaking pay cut to come serve the public. So um, we're always trying to make sure that we find the people that can do the work um, and they don't get paid uh, for their passion, but they get something out of it, uh, knowing you wear the white hat at the end of the day pays for itself. And that's Thank all I have. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Castro. Do we have any questions or comments from Dr. Gananadev? <clears throat> Ms. Castro, I'm sure you know what this is coming. <laughs> so oh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
any time it goes up that high, I understand that it's 10 years later what it is, but it happened about the same time when the VE went away. So the suspicion for many of us is that is that VE going away, that revenue going to the AG's office being put on by increasing cost. As I mentioned before, I absolutely have no problem with the uh, attorney's fee increase. I think we, you, you are charging very low anyway compared to all the attorneys we pay. But, uh, but the other two were somewhat concerning, uh, paralegal and the research analyst. So how did you come to this conclusion? What process you went through to really come up with these rates? Oh, so I can, I can tell you with confidence that we, we were not consulted. The senior assistants of the sections were not consulted on where that number should be. And um, so the number, you know, it, it is a number that we're going to always have to deal with. Uh, the strategies are, you know, maybe considering the cost equation, collecting some of that money back. Um, and again, when I was a new DAG, people settled quicker when it was, when the when the time was not being subsidized by the medical board. You know, the, and by that I mean they're paying their lawyer hourly. And potentially when they have to pay us hourly too if, you know, we entered into a probation agreement or if they took a chance and went to hearing, that hit could be not only the investigators, hourly costs, but the prosecutions. And these were, this, this would be a way to pass that along. Um, obviously you're gonna increase your licensing fees to account for it, um, but the thought process when vertical enforcement was put into place was that in exchange for that, the licensing fees would, you know, be raised, but they would not ha collect costs anymore. So it was very thoughtful. Well, I mean, I, uh, I still don't know which, what part of AG's office did this come up with this, uh, with this new rates. I'm just, I know you weren't involved. It would be our budget office, uh, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my and it's not the only client. I hope you understand that it's uh, across the board. It's every single client, Department of Transportation, all of our clients, CDPH. Um, or, mm -hmm. So my other concern is that if we raise our licensing fee, which is an additional uh, burden on the physicians in California, but there are 30,000 plus physicians who don't live in California, don't practice in California, has California license. I'm not sure what will keep make them if they're not practicing to keep that license. Uh, many people I know from the other states keep California license because they have this dream one day they will come <laughs> to California. I'm not sure why they're dreaming, but they, <laughs> that's what they do want to do. So I think, uh, so we have to also look at what are the other states doing. So it becomes a complex issue, so that's why when the when anything goes up that high percentage wise at one time it's not like annual cpi increases or something it just becomes very concerning especially the non attorney fees mm -hmm. attorney i get it i completely understand you guys are they underpaid that's not even an issue but but the paralegal and research analyst i mean in my mind and probably a few other people's mind Maybe they put it there because they are losing revenue on not having the VE, and that's what I'm just saying. So. Oh, no. Well, I can tell you that every single section is going to be billing the same rate. I don't know what went into the paralegal and auditor, but I, what I can tell you is you're going to be stuck with some paralegal costs because of SB 467 and because of that report that they have to put together in a um, manner that, is going to be able to be examined at any point and backed up by documentary evidence. So in order to take an average of A to B, B to C, and A to D, every single milestone needs to be documented. We've always do documented milestones. We're very transparent with our client on um, where her cases are at at any stage of the process. And at the same time, um, that is a cost and it's a cost that's passed on to you, and you're not the only client that pays for that. I mean, any, every single client in that annual report pays uh, 
for that to happen. So, and that uh, we're going to produce our third annual report. So that came through four years ago. Thank you. Is there any rule or any regulation that? how much cost can go up per year for any, which is basically every department, every thing has that thing. And uh, on this uh, department, there's no regulation that this percentage you can go per year or something? No, I, I really have no depth of knowledge at all. Um, all I know is that the uh, billing rate goes into effect on 9-1 unless we hear otherwise. Um, so, so it hasn't gone into effect. That's the good news, so. Any additional questions from members? Any? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Thank you. Do we have any comments in, from the public? Ms. Ree? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so again, Hannah Ree, Dr. Ree, um, so um, I am someone who's gone through the process and I'm here to tell you that Medical Board, I think it's time to um, interview new attorneys because the decisions that they're making are actually costing you more money. So for example, um, and Ms. Castro made the comment that um, they are your attorneys, they're protecting you, that sort of thing. But in fact, in my case, um, what had happened initially could have been easily resolved, addressed, closed, save you all thousands of dollars. But unfortunately, um, the medical, the attorney, the investigative unit um, sent me to, you know, your psychiatrist and I went to the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said, no mental illness, but um, the state decided, the AG's office decided to go ahead and file um, an ISO, and of course it was denied. And for whatever reason, um, they chose to send me to the psychiatrist again that has no um, training in ethnicity, racial background sort of thing, and called me odd and strange, when in fact I'm, I'm pretty normal for someone with my, um, you know, racial background and religious beliefs. And so what's happened in my case, so certainly I'm revoked, but the decisions that they had made, that AG office had made, resulted in thousands of dollars and um, in, in my case, and of course, you know, we're appealing it. Not only that, medical board members, there are two active ongoing federal civil rights lawsuits um, associated with my, at least two associated with my case alone due to their utilizing um, the color of state law to violate civil rights sort of thing. And look, we roll our eyes or we kind of nod off about it, but if you as medical board members are noting that there's an uptick in the number of civil right lawsuits being filed by physicians against you all, the AG is making decisions that's actually putting you all in, in jeopardy and costing the board more money. Um, so, so another kind of thing that it's in the record books, the AG's office for some reason um, does enjoy mocking, um, mocking uh, defendants um, so in my case, uh, Megan O'Carroll, who, who was the DAG, for some reason um, she felt the need to make fun of the fact that I carry, I keep a, um, a blow dryer in my office because of my hair. My hair is very thick and um, difficult. Include. Yes, thank you. It's difficult to control. And so during the hearing, she felt the need to make fun of the fact that I kept a, a blow dryer in my um in my office and therefore I must be odd and strange so those are her words thank you thank you are there any additional comments are there any comments on the phone yes there is a comment on the phone Mr. Kenwar Gill sir your line is now open um, my name is Kamar Gill and I'm actually speaking on the uh, Attorney General's update um, yeah, she's right in the sense that, you know, if you compare the expenditures from July of last year to June of this year, there actually has been an increase. 
and it's across the board, not just paralegals and analysts. So the cost has not gone down. Vertical enforcement has ended, and I'm not sure if the cases from the 2018, 16, and 17 are lingering on, and those hours are being billed. But um, what also has been important is the task that is given to the Attorney General's office is basically to revoke or suspend a license. And both uh, these actions are required to take away a constitutional, constitutionally protected property. And uh, a physician's license is not a barber a cosmetology license. You know, um, a decade or even 12 to 14 years of effort goes into getting that license. And when you task someone to take away the property of someone protected by the 14th Amendment, I mean, you would expect that person to do his job properly, and there's a cost attached to it. But having said that, I think the only way out of it is basically hiring more staff at the level of CCU, more non-sworn investigators, and hopefully um, have a, a better understanding of the uh, information gathering and investigative process and presenting it to them for only a very selective number of cases where um, both the board staff and the health quality investigation units are in agreement that they have enough evidence or a convincing evidence to pro process and present it to the attorney and then the clock or the billing starts. So I think, you know, the better way of it would be to um, hire more people at the level of non-sworn investigators or even the sworn ones that don't really uh, talk to the attorneys. Uh, and Dr. Ganamadev has expressed a concern that there are people outside of California who maintain a California license. The moment you ask them to pay $1,100 for a new renewal of license, they will strongly consider to see if they want to keep that license, which is an extra one sitting on their desk. They don't really use it. And that is about 30,000 applicants or um, licensees that would probably would not want to, and that cost has to be budgeted in because some of them will not renew the license. So it's a complex situation. I think the staffing needs to be improved at CCU, and that alone would help to um, uh, check the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? There are no additional comments at this time. Okay, great. So before we move to agenda item 19, I would like to take a moment to discuss agenda item 17. Um, overview of California maternal mater maternity, no, mortality, sorry, and morbidity rates and initiatives. Um, so we were to have this scheduled, but our presenter was unable to attend today's meeting. However, she will join us at our next board meeting in San Diego and provide this presentation. So now moving to item 19, update from the Health Quality Investigation Unit Ms. Chris and Ms. Mr. Chris and Ms. Nichols. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is David Chris, and I'm the chief of the Department of Consumer Affairs Division of Investigation. And this is uh, Deputy Chief Kathleen Nichols. We will be providing an update on the division's Health Quality Investigation Unit. HQIU currently has 10 investigator vacancies, which is a 13% uh, vacancy rate. There are currently 16 investigator candidates in background, and all 16 have their post certificate which will not require a six-month uh, police academy and allow them to uh, be effective uh, investigators sooner. Although we have more candidates in background than vacancies, we are continuing to hold uh, pan uh, hiring panels statewide and plan to have multiple candidates in background for every field office in order to prepare for any possible additional vacancies in the future. To help with case aging, uh, HQIU is implementing a task force with uh, the salary savings from the vacancies uh, that we've had in the past. We are hiring 10 retired annuit in investigators and also util utilizing several positions that have been redirected uh, from other DVI programs to assist HQIU on this task force. This graph uh, illustrates the impact the task force will have on reaching our goal uh, of around 1,100 pending cases. As we've mentioned in previous meetings, HQIU investigators have over 2,000 cases pending in field offices now, and this increased workload is impacting case aging. 
With 10 staff uh, on the task force, we were projecting to reach the optimum level uh, of uh, cases in two years. Obviously, with more resources, we will decrease, uh, decrease the amount of time to reach the goal, and we're working with board staff and with the Department of Consumer Affairs to explore further solutions and improvements so we can uh, decrease case aging completion times. Uh, that concludes our update, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments from Dr. Lewis? Yes. <clears throat> Hello again. Hello. <laughs> Always ask the same question every time you're here. Is that the chart that we've asked for? Yes. Okay. Um, I can't see it from here. It's really it's difficult. Is it handed out? So just tell me in your words, sure. since I don't, I can't find it here. Um, the decrease, where are we now? I've got it here. And from where, where are we now and where do we come from? So, like so the red dashed line that's across the middle is, is that's where we'd like to be. And then up closer to 2000 is, is where we are now. That's the upper left hand point where all the lines intersect. Yes. Um, using uh, uh, 10 staff, which is um, what we plan to obtain, I'd like to obtain more, but just with 10, it's gonna take uh, two years to bring that backlog down to that red dashed line, which is where we'd like to be on an ongoing basis. Um, I hope to get uh, additional staff, and we're working with the board and with uh, Department of Consumer Affairs to try and redirect as many people as we can uh, to to this task force. The task force uh, model has been used uh, by other boards uh, that have been in similar circumstances. So we're we're trying to do something new and out of the box. Uh, money is an issue. The board, uh, you know, has been uh, discussing, you know, fee increase. There's there's you know the attorney general's costs. There's there's all kinds of things that have uh, uh, affected funds right now. So this is what we're trying to do with the money that we currently have. To think outside the box to bring those those case aging the case aging down and that backlog down as soon as we can. And you said two years or three years? Two, two, two okay. and and then if if uh, we can direct more staff to that, it'll be sooner. Okay, and then the other one more question: You just rehired a hired retired annuitants. Correct. They have a limited amount of time that they can work throughout the year. Correct. And they go away. That is correct. Um, they can work about half time uh, d during the year. Um, but we have used retired annuitants on other task forces uh, that, that we've uh, completed with the Department of Consumer Affairs, and they have been effective. So they would supplement uh, full-time staff. It's not in, you know, solely retired annuitants. Okay. Thanks. Any Thanks. additional questions from members, comments? Oh, you guys had it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. Do we have any comments from the public? <clears throat> yes, yeah, so um, kind of an, an update uh, with Black Patients Matter. Um, because uh, we have this ongoing uh, federal lawsuit against uh, the DCAHQIU, the problem is that they're not hiring, they're not hiring, and their investigators are not racially diversified. The medical, they're not. And so um, we initially uh, listed uh, their DCA uh, head was Mr. Giglio, but he's no longer in the position, which is interesting. And so we've recently added Mr. Chris as a defendant. Um, the law firm that we're using is in West LA, Fenton Law Group. And I, I'm sure there's a, a cheaper way, I say this all the time, I'm sure there's a more inexpensive way um, to resolve the um, racial disparity, the healthcare disparity. I'm sure there's a, a task force that we can build, but you know, really, lives are on the line, and there's a disproportionate number of African-American patients that have 
um, have passed away and that have um, a lot of issues, medical issues that are not being addressed. And so we, we had to file these lawsuits. And unfortunately, because of the choices that the AG made, your law, because of the choices your law firm has made to represent you, it's costing more money, more lawsuits. And it's just how it goes. So if you notice an uptick in lawsuits filed against you in, um, individually, it's because of that. They are making decisions um, that are unfortunately violating civil rights and the courts are beginning to, to realize that. And again, it's not necessarily the physicians that they're going after as much as the patient population that they serve, underrepresented uh, patient populations, um, in the inner cities, that sort of thing. So um, we definitely have an active lawsuit going in against the HQIU because if, there's, if they're telling you that the problem with cases um, being investigated is taking a long time or um, it's taking a long time for accusations to be filed, it's because of this. The reason why it's taking a long time is because of the thousands and thousands of complaints and cases and, and numbers of patient complaints that are made. They are selecting a few and they're trying to make that circle fit into that square opening. That's why the cases are taking so long. In my case, the ISO was denied. There's no mental illness. But because of their bias, whatever's going on in their office, they chose to go after it. And now it's going to be appealed. And now there's two federal civil rights lawsuits active, ongoing in two separate courts. Please conclude. So medical board, of course, no one wants to sue a physician. No one wants to go through lawsuits. Your time is up. But it's effective. Thank you. Thank you. And is there anyone else in the audience that wants to make a comment? Anyone on the line? There is no one on the phone lines at okay. this time. We're going to move to item number 26, update from the Department of Consumer Affairs. Mr. Lay. Good afternoon, President Pines, Vice President Lewis, uh, Secretary Kraus, Executive Officer Kirkmeyer, members of the board. Uh, it's good to see you all again in beautiful Burlingame. Uh, as always, <laughs> thank you so much for providing an opportunity for the department to provide uh, an update to your board. Uh, but before I start, I want to take a quick minute of personal privilege and extend the warmest welcomes to your four brand new board members, uh, Dr. Thorpe, Mr. Watkins, uh, Dr. Mahmoud, and Dr. Casillas, although she uh, was not able to be here today. Uh, welcome to the Department of Consumer Affairs family. Uh, we are incredibly honored to have received your appointment from the Governor's Office and Senate Rules Committee, and we are very much looking forward uh, to be working with you. I know I had uh, opportunities to speak with you over the phone during the appointment process, but it's really great to finally uh, meet you in person. Um, if that's okay, I thought I'd take a minute to talk about our office and what we do for a couple of reasons. One, so uh, you can uh, know which resources uh, we can offer to you and, and, and what services we can provide. Uh, but also because yesterday at the meeting I was sitting in the back and then one of the audience members uh, came up to me and asked me, uh, are you a high school student here to uh, talk about SP276? Like, no, that's why I need to like grow older and grow a beard and uh, <laughs> you know, make sure they have more validity at board meetings. Uh, so funny. for the purposes of introductions, oh. my my name is Patrick Lay. I'm the Assistant Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Services at the Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, our office serves as an extension for the DCA Executive Office, uh, and I work under the leadership of our Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Services, Christopher Castrillo, uh, as well as alongside my uh, counterpart, Karen D. Nelson. Uh, between the three of us, uh, our role is to support all the 38 boards, bureaus, and commissions that make up the Department of Consumer Affairs. So to give you a bit of flavor, I do work closely with the medical board, uh, but also work uh, closely with the Board of Pharmacy, the Dental Board, uh, and my counterpart works very closely with the non-healthcare board, such as the, the Court Reporters Board. Uh, we also uh, support various boards and commissions, such as uh, the State Athletic Commission or the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Uh, our primary role is to be a liaison for our board staff and as needed for board members as well uh, to the Governor's Office and our umbrella agency, the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. We are also your link 
to any services uh, that are offered by DCA. So under our department, uh, we are home to many units. Uh, think about human resources, uh, budget and, and physical operations, uh, communications, publishing and design. Uh, and should the board need any assistance uh, in, uh, uh, in any of these areas to bolster any activity, uh, existing activities, uh, we are here uh, to assist. Uh, in partnership with your executive officer, uh, Ms. Kirkmeyer will also provide support uh, to board members. Uh, these can come in all and any forms, uh, ranging uh, to being uh, your link to the governor's office or the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. Uh, we can provide logistical support as you go through Senate confirmation, for example, uh, or if it is assisting uh, with compliance with any of the trainings that board members have to go through uh, as required uh, by law. But uh, really, my main point is that uh, we are here to serve and support you uh, in our collaborative mission of ensuring uh, patient protection and consumer protection. Uh, so uh, with that, I will move on to my regularly scheduled DCA update, uh, starting with the DCA director. Uh, and uh, as you may be aware, earlier this year, the Department of uh, Consumer Affairs former uh, director, Dean Grafilo, uh, left the department to uh, take a position with the private sector. Uh, the governor's office uh, continues to work towards identifying a successor. Uh, and the DC Executive Office is preparing to ensure a smooth transition uh, the moment a new director uh, is appointed. Uh, we will let you know as soon as we have news of a leadership transition. Uh, my next update is regarding the director's quarterly meeting. So although we are without a director, business must go on. And so on June 3rd, Chief Deputy Director Chris Schultz hosted the DCA quarterly director's uh, meeting. Uh, during this meeting, he communicated his commitment to performing both roles during this interim period to ensure we keep the lights on at the department until a new director uh, is appointed. Uh, during this transition period, uh, Mr. Schultz encouraged executive officers and board members to send ideas uh, regarding cross-cutting projects that we could collectively accomplish or suggestions where new leadership uh, and the administration uh, could focus. My next update is regarding the executive officer salary study, uh, a topic that I know is important to the board. Uh, and as a refresher, the department uh, retained KH Consulting to conduct an in-depth executive officer salary study. Uh, the study aimed to provide an in-depth analysis of programmatic and operational complexities of DCA boards and determine how, over the years, the role of an executive officer uh, has evolved. Uh, the study also provided a benchmark salary comparison uh, for survey from other states. On July 8th, uh, the executive officer salary study was distributed to executive officers and board presidents. In addition, the executive office uh, hosted a meeting to discuss the findings uh, on July 12th. In terms of next steps, we are currently reaching out to each board to set up one-on-one -on -one meetings with the executive officers and board president to discuss program-specific findings. We have an opportunity to do so with President Pines and Executive Officer Kirkmeyer, and we will continue to do so with other programs in order to gather input and feedback from all of our programs. Uh, our team would like to extend our sincere uh, appreciation for everyone's patience uh, on the release uh, of this study. My last and final update uh, is regarding board member training. Uh, I provided uh, our new board members with a welcome letter that aligns some of the key trainings required by law, uh, but there are two that I would like to specifically highlight. Uh, the first one is the board member orientation training, or BMOT. It is a one-day uh, training, usually in Sacramento, that outlines the important responsibilities and functions of the board members. Uh, board members are required by law to take this training within one year of appointment or reappointment on a board. Uh, the next one is scheduled to be on October 23rd, with additional dates to be uh, announced soon. Uh, you can register for this training online, or you can contact either your executive officer or any members of the Board and Bureau Services team uh, for registration or additional information. And the last training that I would like to highlight is sexual harassment prevention training. Uh, 2019 is a mandatory uh, training year for the Department of Consumer Affairs. This means that all employees and board members are required to complete this training this year, even if it was completed last year. Uh, the department would like to achieve 100% uh, compliance from managers and supervisors, including board members. Uh, the training is online, can be completed at our convenience, uh, and the department believes that it's a highly important training to ensure a safe workplace environment uh, for all. So uh, this concludes my update. Again, uh, welcome to all of the new board members. Looking forward to be working with you, and I can take any questions that the board may have. Thank you, Mr. Lay.
do we have any questions from any of the board members? No? Oh. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. Any questions or comments, rather, from the public? Uh, yes, just me again. Um, so um, I guess uh, in the past, um, it sounds like um, there was a, a nonprofit uh, advocate group here that um, had sued you all as well. And but it, it ended up that um, I guess you all had been working together to develop um, new legislation. And I, as I recall, one of the, I think maybe Ms. Pines had, had um, awarded her uh, something for working together on that legislation. So here at Black Patients Matter, we don't want to be marginalized. If in fact, um, you know, despite our lawsuits, and I, I do apologize for that, despite our lawsuits, could we also work with members of the board? Are you commenting in on the DCA update? in developing legislation. Uh, the point is that we don't want to be marginalized, uh, which is why we, we actually are in an active lawsuit with the DCA uh, that was just here, because uh, they were marginalizing us. So I just want to reach out to the board uh, to maybe work with us on legislation, as you had already uh, had done with um, a nonprofit that sued you. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Any comments from the public in the audience? Any comments on the phone? No comments on the phone at this time. Okay. Moving to agenda item 21, update on the stem cell regenerative therapy task force. Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Krause. Thank you very much. Um, at the July 2018 board meeting, the board was to provide a policy that was adopted by the Federation of State Medical Boards at their annual meeting. The policy contains several recommendations for state boards regarding regenerative and stem cell therapy practices. Later at the October 2018 board meeting, Ms. Pines established a task, board task force on stem cell and regenerative therapy. In April 2019, the board staff met with the California Department of Public Health to discuss issues regarding stem cell and regenerative therapy and discuss how the two entities could work together. There were discussions regarding potential legislation Legislation and legislation that individuals were discussing may be introduced. The two organizations are also discuss some of the issues regarding investigating complaints regarding these practices. On June 27, 2019, the task force members met with board staff to discuss oversight options the board may decide to pursue to protect California consumers from unapproved and potentially dangerous stem cell products and therapies and next steps. A few options discussed included the development of educational materials, exploring outreach opportunities, and developing best practice guidelines similar to those adopted by the Federation. The task force also discussed the need for some type of guidance for informed consent. While current law requires notice to patients regarding stem cell therapies, it only requires notification to the patient that the therapy is not FDA approved and encouraging the patient to consult with their primary care physician. The task force believes <clears throat> a more in-depth informed consent may be needed. In addition, discussion also included the need for adverse event reporting and what would be required for each reporting. It was determined that the task force hold an interested parties meeting to receive feedback from consumers, experts, and stakeholders to assist in the development of materials, guidelines, and or to determine if there are additional options that should be considered. At this meeting, the board is also going to ask for presentations from the California Department of Public Health and the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. This will occur on Wednesday, September 18th at 1.30 p.m. in Sacramento. If necessary, a second interested parties meeting will be held by mid-November. The task force hopes to have recommendations presented to the board at its January 2020 meeting. That concludes our update. Thank you. Are there any questions from the members? Comments? Any comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? Yes, there is one comment on the phone. Mr. Ken Wagil, your line is now open. 
Well, my name is Kamar Gill. I'm calling from Fresno, California, and this is in specific uh, um, board agenda item on uh, stem cells. Um, back in 2004, supporters of Prop 71 claimed that nearly half of the California families could benefit from the cell stem cells treatments the Prop 71 would help create. One of the studies these guys commissioned found that the new life-changing therapies could emerge in just a few years. They also claimed the Prop 71 would pay off financially, and they claim they'll be creating thousands of jobs, returning the state investments uh, back to the state in about uh, a few years, and it'll be seven times uh, return on investment. So in 2004, California votes uh, 59 to 41 person to um, to pass the Proposition 41, an amendment to the state constitution, uh, which would create California Institute of Regenerative Medicine of the sum through a U.S. dollar $3 billion bond issue. Interest added another $3 billion to the bill. Now the sum funding is running out, and its supporters plan to ask voters to authorize another $5 billion funding in 2020. Californians thought that they were voting for quick cures, not, the, not training the scientists or uh, setting up new buildings. So what happened is something different altogether. There has been no federally approved treatment that have been produced. And without marketable therapies, the public is still far from reaping the $91 billion in healthcare savings, which is claimed to be given back to public by 2040. SERM has funded nearly 50 clinical trials but just four of them have been completed, and meaning the scientists involved, all the patients, they said they would, and finished compiling the data. One of the trials was an observational study that tested no therapies. The others involved treatment that are still years at the best from reaching the market. The state once told to expect 1.1 billion in royalties from some back discoveries within 35 years, so far has received just a tiny fraction of amount a single payment of $190,000 from City of Hope Medical Research Center in Los Angeles County. Toxic combination of unrealistic hopes and failure of reputable researchers at CERM to deliver upon the, uh, deliver the um, cures uh, has resulted in unexpected uh, results which you guys are going to deal with. It's the proliferation of clinics offering unproven and something dangerous therapies. And, you know, you, you guys have to deal with it. It's a, it's a fallout of something you supported years ago. And I guess this update is just a primer for that funding that's going to be requested next year. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? There are no additional comments at this time. Okay. Moving to agenda item 25, presentation on the posting requirements for public documents. Ms. Kirschmeyer. Well, since I'm standing between you and the door, <laughs> this will be the fastest presentation you've had today. Um, so we had had a, a request um, from one of the board members asking if we could just go over real quickly the documents and how long they stay on the web, how you obtain documents for the public or for anybody else, just to let licensees know as well about the documents that the medical board posts. So it's really important for the medical board, unlike a lot of the other departments um, or other boards under the Department of Consumer Affairs, we actually have very specific public disclosure laws that, re that basically state what information we have to post on our website, what information is available to the public. So first, there's two code sections in 2027 and 2221.05 that state specifically what the medical board will post on its website, and we post that information on a physician's profile. If you go out and look at a, a physician, um, one that has disciplinary action or other actions, you'll see there all of the information that we post. All of that is basically defined by those code sections, and we adhere very strictly to those code sections. Then there's another code section, 803.1, which actually talks about what information is available to the public public upon request. We, those two laws sometimes, um, we make sure that we're always in coordination with those laws for what needs to be on the website, what information we can provide to the public. Um, and then we also have two uh, California Code of Re uh, Regulation sections that actually further clarify the information that is available to the public. One is particular to citations only, and one is a general code um, section that talks about all of the different documents that the medical board has and that we use and that we post. 
We actually have an exceptional document that's actually out on the website that provides information by document type as to what information is available and where it's available. That's one of the biggest things for our board that's a difference is because you have the 803.1 section that says information is public um, and here's where you can go to get it. But then we have sections in 2027 that says, well, it can only be posted on the board's website for this amount of time or under only under these circumstances. So it, there's sometimes, it's not a conflict, it's just that you can't always get all of the information on the board's website. You actually have to, in some instances, contact the board to get the information as well. So that's why we actually put this document together and it, it does go by um, section and whether you can get it on the website and how long and then whether you can get it in for, through co contacting the medical board, either writing to the board or calling in. So just to go real briefly over each of the different um, types of documents that we have. So if there's a suspension or restriction order, that would be something like an interim suspension order, a, a PC23 code section, um, automatic suspension order. Those are only available on the website for the time that the physician is actually under that suspension or restriction. Once that time frame ends, usually what happens is a decision becomes effective. That um, suspension is no longer in, uh, that individual is no longer under that suspension. They're uh, now under this disciplinary action. It's removed from the website, but it's always a public document. So it's always going to be available at the medical board. So if an individual to write to, write to us, that would information would be provided to them. Accusations and petitions to revoke and, and documents like that, those are available on the board's website until the final disposition of that accusation um, or petition to revoke or accusation and petition to revoke. And usually what happens is if, if there's an outcome where there's some type of disciplinary action, then it's going to be attached to that disciplinary action. If, if its um, accusation is withdrawn, it is immediately remo removed from the board. And this is one that's a little bit different because um, per our government codes or our uh, CCR section, that actually is with, once it's withdrawn, one year after that, that is purged. So that is no longer a public document. So that one, if it's withdrawn, it's completely gone after that year. However, if it's an accusation that's been dismissed, that one actually is a public document. Um, which is actually available at the board. So it comes off the website, but it's still a document that an individual can write in and get a copy of, and it's something that an individual can have from the medical board, because again, it is a public document, because it's a, a proposed decision from an administrative law judge. For all of our disciplinary actions, for the most part, they are on the website indefinitely. So you have a, a revocation, a surrender, probation, those documents are on the website, it's on that profile indefinitely. If it is a public letter of reprimand or a public reprimand, it's only available on that physician's profile for 10 years. After that time, it re gets removed from their profile, but it is a document that is available to, again, to the public, but they'd have to call in or write in to get a copy of it. Probationary licenses, this is something that we're currently in the process of changing through the legislative process, but for right now, if an individual is issued a probationary license at the time they apply to the medical board and we put them on probation, it is removed immediately from their profile as soon as that probation is done. Again, it's a public document though and it's always available at the board. Um, we're working on right now legislation that would make that a 10 year time frame, so it would be available for 10 years from the effective date. Citation orders, they're available um, from the date it is resolved, so the individual either pays the, the fee for that citation or they've gone through a process and it, it's been upheld. That is actually available on our website for three years, um, as long as it has not been withdraw withdrawn or dismissed. If it's withdrawn or dismissed, it's immediately pulled from the website and it's no longer public. And then the last one is a public letter of reprimand that's issued at the time of licensure. Um, per the law, and that's that 2221.05, this is actually only available for three years. And unlike the other documents, it was written into the statute that not only does it come off the website in three years, but it also is no longer public. So those documents are purged. So they're no longer available for those individuals. These are actually items that are on a physician's profile. However, we do not have any public documents on these. So we have to post information pursuant to 2027 or 803.1, but if a phys an individual wanted documents on these, we would not have these documents. Again, these are pretty much, for the most part, all documents that are not board documents. These are a court, other court document um, that, that happens or a hospital peer review document. We don't have these documents. 
So if it's a judgment or arbitration award or a malpractice settlement, we're going to put the information out there, but we don't have the documents to back it up, but it has information about those two types of activities. Again, malpractice settlements, please remember that those are only available on the board's website. If a physician has had three or more malpractice settlements within a five-year time frame, um, three malpractice settlements if it is in a um, low risk category and four or more if it's in a high risk category. Felony convictions, those are always posted on the medical board's website, but again, just information about them, not the documents. You'd have to go to the court to get those. Misdemeanor convictions is an interesting one. Although we get the information, we don't post the information on a misdemeanor conviction on the board's website per the law unless we file an accusation against uh, charging that specific misdemeanor um, conviction. If that happens, then it gets posted on the website. If it is not listed in an accusation, it or if that accusation is dismissed or withdrawn, it comes off the website. 805 reporting, the only 805 information that you get out there is if a physician's privileges have actually been terminated or revoked, if they're suspended, if they get some type of restriction on them. Those are not public. That's only for the medical board's use. But if they're terminated or revoked, it gets placed on the board's website, and that information is out there. And then the last one is out-of-state action. We post if when another state takes action against a physician, put it on our website. Again, the documents are not available from our board unless we've actually filed an accusation and we're going to take action, and it's attached to that accusation, as all of you have seen in certain cases. And with that, any questions? No questions? All right. Well, you did a great job. Approach. <laughs> that was very fast. Are there any comments from the audience? Faster than Jennifer. Any comments on the phone? No comments on the phone at this time. Okay. Before we move to our final uh, agenda item, um, I'd like to um, congratulate Dr. Krause and Dr. Lewis for joining and maintaining on the, the executive team, joining the executive team. And I'd like to officially welcome to the board Dr. Thorpe, Mr. Watkins, Dr. I always get it wrong, Mahmoud, and Dr. Casillas, who is not here with us. Final agenda item is future items on the agenda. Are there any board members, Dr. Gananadev? <clears throat> yeah, I think we talked about it a lot today, so I would like to have our staff look into what the licensing fee in the other states are, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, what states are actually recovering the cost of investigation compared to California? So these are the two issues which came up, so let's get some, some intelligent information before we go somewhere with it. You want okay. medical? No, no, it's only for the medical boards, yeah, yes. There are, uh, in California, there are boards that collect no, this is the other states. The other other states. states. What other states? What's the, like New York, Texas, I mean the bigger states where the licensing fee is and also see which states are recovering the fee uh, when they go for investigation. There is... There's a reason why we don't. There is also could be a, there, that could be also the one which delays what we do because there is nothing to lose for somebody is being investigated when uh, other than their own attorney fee, they don't have to pay anything here. So we want to really look at it a little more carefully. Okay, great. Any other future agenda items from any members? Dr. Hawkins? So uh, telemedicine seems to be the one we should look at. Future. Uh, telemedicine. Can you be more specific so we know what you're looking for? Um, because we just had a, just a presentation on telemedicine, so I know I need to know exactly what, what you're looking for. Let me think about it then. Let me think about it. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, we have a comment from the audience, Doug Halstead. Okay, I'm still a physician in pediatrics and integrative medicine. Um, I've uh, started treating autoimmune issues in my practice over the last 19 years. 
Um, one of the really big ones that comes forward is autism. And the reason that's important for me is um, 50 years ago, the incidence of autism was truly, truly a one in 10,000 children. Presently, the incidence of autism in our communities is one out of 40 children, and it's actually one out of 25 children uh, who are males. Um, I have seen predictions of future um, incidence of autism as running up to one and two by 2024. I don't think I believe that, but in the 19 years that I've been seeing autistic children, I saw the incidence rise from one out of 567 to the one out of 40. I would be happy to give the board a presentation on what autism is and the various um, components of it in a future date. Um, the big things are epigenetics, genetics, and the environment. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Right, so I've seen that you've been forth. able You're to speak about this. an agenda item? Yeah, and yes, as a future agenda item. Okay. You've made the request. Right. I've seen that you can uh, speak about physicians' burnout. We should be able to speak about what I believe is going to be one of the biggest epidemics on the planet. You've made the request. This is not a back okay. and forth. Very good. Okay. Are there any other comments from the public for future agenda items? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Rehir. So um, we would also like to learn more about the telehealth network. Um, I've got Mr. Erica Brown's business card, and I'm sure you have his contact information. But if not, I don't mind submitting this if you need it. But certainly in, uh, for home health care um, and working in um, rural areas. But interestingly enough, um, there's a lot of folks uh, that live in the inner cities that are homebound. And this would be a wonderful service to be able to uh, reach out to them and to learn more about. So um, do you need his card? No. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any you. additional comments in the audience? OK. Oh, hold on. Get to the mic. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Just on, uh, on behalf of the um, interest of the conflicts of interest and fi or financial disclosure of conflicts of interest um, law, I was going to ask to add that on behalf of the bill and, and um, the Center for Public Interest Law, just to add that to the agenda for next, next time. And I can provide you with more information if you need before the next meeting. Thank you. I'd like to add an agenda item. A future agenda item is to have um, an overview of autism, um, sort of a national perspective, and then a perspective specifically to the state of California. Are there any comments on the phone? There is one more comment on the phone by Mr. Ken Garwell. Sir, your line is now open. My name is Kamar Kiel, and I'm making uh, comments on items, not an agenda. I would want medical board to um, to specifically take um, or make a presentation on telemedicine, and I would want board staff to do it because right now. Um, the field is really wild west. Nobody knows what what actually is the standard of care for direct to consumer telemedicine and versus the telemedicine that we are typically used to, which is originating site and a distant site with medical professional on both sides of the camera. Um, so medical board has had listed a page on their website where they claim that the standard of care is the same, and then they leave it up to the doctor to decide the standard of care. So we have doctors in Fresno, pediatricians, who have been reprimanded publicly. And if you look through the, um, the actual document, the, for the reprimand was because the pediatrician failed to look inside the nose and comment on the color and consistency of a nasal discharge. So on one end, we have medical board reprimanding physicians, failure to do a good faith exam. 
On other end, we have Dr. Chaudhary comes and sells us the front-facing camera and the location-enabled phone, saying that this is the next era of expectation from the patient. So board has to come and find a middle ground. You cannot have a two standard of care, one for telemedicine and the one for regular medicine. And then you'll be causing a lot of confusion with your own medical experts who, by the way, probably would not understand what telemedicine is. So it would be a good idea to sit together and decide what is telemedicine, what is telehealth, and what rulemaking is needed to have uniformity in application of standard of care. Because until that is done, it is really fruitless to have the discussions around telemedicine unless the board staff, the board's expert reviewers, everybody is on board what constitutes the standard of care and what does not constitute the standard of care. That clarity is missing, and somebody has to come to the board, make a presentation, preferably board staff, and commit to uh, those words later on when the litigation starts to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? There are no additional comments on the phone at this time. Okay, the next agenda item is adjournment. Thank you.